And good afternoon everybody. Hello and welcome. My name is Paul Grogan and today I'm going to be teaching my favourite game of 2019. Not kidding. I haven't officially announced it yet because I don't do that till December. But Cloud Spy was my number one favourite game of 2019. And this afternoon I have the opportunity to teach it to two good friends of mine. Now the plan was this video was actually going to happen months ago. People were going to come around my house and I was going to do a video where we were going to uh, live stream me teaching the game to two friends of mine. And then, of course, the world situation changed. And uh, yeah, we didn't do that. But this weekend, as part of Virtual GridCon, we're going to be doing it. But we're going to be using online tools instead. So we're going to be using Tabletop Simulator to play this game. Obviously, playing the game with the physical components is always better. But yeah, we do what we can in these uh, difficult situations. And the implementation on Tabletop Simulator is, is pretty good. So yeah, I'm going to be teaching the game today uh, to two friends of mine. Uh, first of all, let's say hello to Andy. Hello, sorry, just unmuting there. That's okay. Now, when did I first tell you about this game? Probably when the box arrived, I think. <laughs> yeah, quite a long time ago now. The components are amazing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Andy's one of my regular game group comes around and uh, yeah, he came around and I was like, you know, a kid with new toys showing him <laughs> all of the bits of it. Um, and that was when I sort of first proposed the idea that, oh yeah, well, you know, if you come around, we can teach you how to play. Um, and also Ian's joining us today. Hello, Ian. Hello, Paul. Now, I'll be honest, the other person who was going to join the stream this weekend is Alan, who's another local friend of mine, because Andy and Alan were the two people that were going to come round. Uh, Alan couldn't make it today, but Ian has stepped in. What made you interested in learning how to play this game, Ian? Um, your videos. Okay. It's pretty much been my only exposure to the game. Right. And uh, you're responsible for so many purchases on my show, you should be on commission. I should be. I should be. Well, unfortunately, I'm not. Um, so you've you've seen some of my other video content, but of course, sitting down and actually learning how to play it is what makes things stick. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've not seen a physical copy either. I'm on the Kickstarter. Right. Um, so uh, ho hopefully uh, that'll turn up when it turns up, and I can start uh, indoctrinating my friends locally. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining in the YouTube chat. I don't have the YouTube chat on screen yet, but once we've got going, I will put the YouTube chat on screen so that I can I can see what you're doing. Uh, we also have on the Skype call, uh, all the way across the pond, Mark. Hi, friends. I'm just usually here to tell people they're doing things wrong. So yeah, <laughs> that's what I do for fun. So this is... This is, this is one of those games where I think I know it quite well, and I've played it about eight times, but I did not feel comfortable doing this stream without Mark as my wingman, because, yeah, it's one of those games, and there are a few games out there that every time you play it, you'll make one little mistake, or maybe more than one little mistake. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, Mark, you're pretty much a, a rules expert with this game. I think not, so. Yeah, I, there we go. I, uh... <laughs> But not only are you a rules expert, having played against you, you are also very good at the game itself. Well, I mean, I got fourth place in the Cloud Spire tournament uh, that we, we host on Facebook, so right. I'm not the best. Okay, but you are, yeah, you're, you're very good. Um, so Cloud Spire is one of those games where, you know, as I say, I've played it, I don't know, six, seven, eight times or something like that. And then I played against Mark and I saw how the game is actually supposed to be played. And whilst I was getting the rules of the game right, strategically, tactically, I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. So it is a very, very skillful, very tactical game. Today's game is going to be one where we're going to be, I'm going to be teaching Ian and Andy how to play, and we're going to be starting to play as soon as possible. This game is a learning game, okay? I'm not going to go through every single rule in minute detail before we start playing. I'm going to feed them the rules as we go along, and we're going to write this game off as a as a learning game which i think for a game like this is is probably one of the best ways to play in my opinion which is which is why i'm doing this plus i don't want to explain loads and loads and loads of rules before we start moving the pieces around so um in fact alan is here uh, alan is in the chat so uh, yeah he's here while he's working thank you very much for joining in alan and you can see you can see the game okay so what is cloud spire for those people who don't know anything about the game it's a one to four tower defense MOBA style game but if you did have actually described it to me like that I wouldn't have been interested in the slightest because I don't really have much interest in tower defense games or MOBA games but this 
sort of does it in board game form. Uh, it is one to four players. There is there's solo modes. There's a whole book of solo scenarios. The multiplayer mode uh, is either competitive or cooperative. There are some cooperative scenarios in there. Uh, and you can also play team mode as well, 2v2. Uh, what we're playing today is the very simple 1v1. Uh, and we're playing two of the factions. Now, the base game comes with four factions. There is the Greege, which is an add-on, which is a fifth faction. Uh, and we're playing today with two factions that Ian and Andy chose at random. We have the Brawnen, which is going to be Andy. Uh, and we have the Ayres, which is going to be Ian. So straight away, we can see there is a pile of chips here. This is everything that the Ayres have. Uh, they are basically purple. So they have all of these chips. Each chip is a particular unit. So where you see multiple ones in a stack, uh, that means there's multiple ones of that unit. Uh, and they're two-sided. And the other side of the chip uh, has got, I mean, depending on the faction, some of them are upgraded units, uh, up upgraded versions of, of the main chips. Uh, some of the other factions, what's on the other side is actually a completely different unit. So yeah, all the factions work in an extremely different way. Uh, but as well as you having your, uh, your units here, uh, which are divided into three things. Well, you've actually got your heroes. So your three heroes are down at the bottom. Uh, these are the gold bordered ones. Then you have the minions, which are the copper bordered ones. And then at the top, you have these gray bordered ones. They're the spires. So I mentioned at the start, it's a tower defense game. Uh, I won't try and refer, I'll try and ref not refer to them as towers in this game because they're called spires. But you will be building spires on the board that will then attack your opponent as your opponent starts to move towards you. As well as all of the chips, which is the unit, you also have your fortress, okay? So each player has their own fortress. Uh, and whilst the fortresses look similar, you know, they're the same size, they're the same shape, um, all of the abilities of that fortress are unique. Each faction is, is completely different. Uh, and you also have a reference sheet, which is two-sided, which contains everything that you need to know about that particular faction. And I sent these both to Ian and Andy yesterday, so hopefully they've been having a read through uh, just to get an idea of, of, of how that faction works. Right, now, how the game plays and how you win the game. There's two... We're, we're going to be playing the game over a maximum of four waves. You, each of the uh, fortresses starts off with ten health. If any of the fortresses... Get, if you get your opponent's fortress down to zero health, you win immediately. But if that doesn't happen by the end of the fourth wave, we go to the points. And the points are very simple. It's the health remaining of your fortress plus an extra one for each little peg you've got in it because there are these tiny little pegs here and these pegs you will put into the different spots on your fortress to upgrade it and each peg in your fortress at the end of the game is worth one point and that's it that is the victory conditions you win by getting your opponent's uh, fortress down to zero health or add up the points at the end of the game uh, which in this particular setup is is four waves okay let's get rid of that um, there you go. That's probably enough of a high level overview before we jump into the setup. So we're going to start setting up the board. Now, when I first started playing the game, because we're going to make some choices during setup, I just made random choices because I didn't understand the impact that those choices were going to have. Now I've got a few games under my belt. The initial setup is actually can be quite important depending on certain decisions you make. So Ian and Andy, you're going to be where I was when I first played and I'm going to give you choices and you're going to be like, well, I've no idea. This doesn't make any difference. And you might not think it does, but it, it will later on. So what we have is we have seven islands in here and we're going to take them out and we're going to put them face down around the center aisle, which is Mark's handle on uh, the, the Discord channel. So here we go. So we're going to put these. Oh, not that one. I'm always doing that. Accidentally picking up one. Now there are seven islands, uh, so one of them doesn't get used. Okay, right. Then what we need to do is we need to roll to see who is going first. I think technically what you're supposed to do is you roll to decide who's going first and the first player will choose what faction they want to play and then the other player chooses where they start. But for today, since we kind of did that at random, I'm just gonna roll the dice and on a one to three, Andy's gonna be the first player. So one, so Andy. You need to decide which of these islands is the one where you're going to start on. And then we flip it over and um, rotate actually, it. Oh, go on. Um, 
if Andy is the first player, then that means that Ian will pick the first. Oh, right. Okay. So that that this is in reverse order. Okay. Yes, you're right. Sorry. So Andy is the first player. So Ian, which of these do you want to go on? Now, don't feel that you have to go on this one just because it's nearest you, because we're going to move these things around oh, wherever. This one. This one. This, this, this one here. Okay. I'm on, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on the right, but I'll, okay. I'll go there anyway. Just to right. Keep... So what we do is we flip this over, and now you can rotate it however you want, as long as. Oh, and then you attach your fortress to it. Okay. So your fortress is going to be attached to it somehow, as long as. Your fortress gate, which is this hex here, is surrounded on all three sides. And there is a path, so this is path, from your fortress gate to the center aisle. Okay, so with those two restrictions, you can place these however you want. And again, you're probably thinking, well, what difference does that make? So if you kept this aisle like this, you could start here, that would be fine. Or you could start there. Or you might want to say, oh, actually, I'll rotate that like that and I'll start there. So you do have a few choices uh, and it, it, yeah, it's basically up to you however you want to start. Um, I will leave it like that. OK, Seems right. Uh, in, interesting, uh, interesting little offset. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock these in position so we don't accidentally move them around. OK, uh, right now, Andy. You may think that you have to start over here because a lot of other games are like, oh, in a two-player game, the other player starts opposite. But no, not in this game. In a two-player game of Cloudspire like this, you can choose any of these <coughs> to start with. And if you were to choose this one or this one, for example, it would be a very strange short game. But you could. <laughs> but you can choose any of them. Which one of those remaining five would you like to choose? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go for something or easy, I'll go opposite. Okay, so again, we flip that over and rotate that and and then attach your fortress however you want to. Right, now I assume I need to rotate it so that there is a connected path. Yes, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go with that. Okay, so we'll lock that in position. Uh, is that valid? Is it... Yep, the path leads from there all the way around yeah. here to the center. So yeah, that's that's good. Right, we're going to lock these in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to reveal the rest of them. Uh, and Mark, I know when we last played this, we were not 100% sure of how this works. Have you, can they... choose, you can choose any of them. Okay, but it's, it's Ian next, is it, that reveals one? Oh yeah, it's, it's a continuous... Okay. So, Ian, which of these would you now like to reveal? Um, let's do this one. Again, these choices might be like, well, this is meaningless, but yeah, it, it, it makes more sense once you've once you've played it. And again, you now choose the rotation of that one, as long as there is a path connecting to this centre here. So it can't be like that. Okay. What's the? Oh, there we go. There's the rotation. Yeah, see, that's allowed. Yeah, you see, here's your choice. If you put it like yeah, that... I don't really okay. want... Yeah, I'm going to say I've got, then got that path around the lake. You've now got two ways around the lake, which could be good, could be bad. Well, I'm going to go over there like that. Yeah, okay. So lock that one in. So then Andy chooses this next one. So we go clockwise round from that one. So Andy, you're doing this one. So we flip okay. that over. And again, you can leave it like that, or you can rotate it. Ah. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay, so just try and line these up a bit. There we go. So Ian, you're you're flipping this one. Happy with that? Yeah, it's like a path to nowhere. I it's don't think it's in a legal position. No, it's it's got to lead to the direct. Oh, it's, it's got to lead to the centre. Yeah, right. directly. Yeah. Yeah. 
no worries. Otherwise, you'd build a nice way around the back. <laughs> uh, no, well, that, that's what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still my plan. Um, so, there's only those two. Yeah. Ends. There's normally only two, sometimes three. Uh, okay. On, we'll lock that in. And then finally, this one. Paul will teach you about escapes later, so yep. that might still be a plan. Okay, yep. right. Deep. Let's log that one in place. Right, so that's that part of the initial setup done. The next thing to do is to populate uh, some landmarks on the board. So you'll notice a number of these spaces on the board have like little glowing blue bits. They are source. That's where you're going to get source from, which is one of the currencies in the game. They are uh, source wells, I think. Uh, there is two on each of the six islands around the outside. Uh, and there is one in the center okay now mark is doing the setup for us which is great um but the two source wells that are closest to the players start off with swamp tiles on so basically there are three different types of landmarks uh, and the swamp ones are specifically designed that they are good for being the first ones that you encounter so what you do if you were playing the physical game you take the swamp ones shuffle them all together we put one here like we have done, and also one here, because they are the closest ones to the players. Then the rest of the swamp ones get mixed in with all of the other ones, they all get shuffled, and then they get placed on all of the other ones on the board. Now, whatever you do, don't look at the other side of them until I, um, until I tell you you're allowed to, because they are secret, uh, so you're not allowed to look at the other side of them. Right, okay, next thing to do is we need to give you, uh, well, Mark's already done it. So you have uh, your health, which in the game is actually a, a physical... Um, disc that you rotate round but for the tabletop similar in implementation we're going to be playing with these counters so the red counter is your health and you start with 10 health each and that will generally go down it's rare that it can go back up and the blue one is going to be your source and at the start of the game you have no source but you will gain source as the game goes on and you have a maximum limit of 20 source so just remember that anytime you're gaining source you cannot go above 20 so they are your two trackers uh what else do we need to do to start with um we have the relic deck we don't need that to start with we have the event deck i'll shuffle them but we don't need them to start with we need the market so yeah we need to build the market uh so the market is over on the left hand side of the board and the market is made up of one earthscape tile and a number of other tiles equal to uh, the players plus one so we have three market tiles which i'm going to reveal and we have an earthscape tile okay i'll come on to the market in a bit more in a minute but that is the market uh what else do we need to do i think that is almost it for the physical set is there anything i've missed mark no okay so that is the setup done right now the game is played over as i mentioned four waves in fact i can show these waves if where's the rulebook gone rulebook is up here uh, back of the rule book is oh in fact it's there quick reference thank you right so there's the quick reference um, so yeah so there are four waves in this particular game each wave is divided into those phases that you can see there the first phase is the event phase we skip that in wave one the next phase is the income phase and as I mentioned at the start I'm not going to explain all of the rules before we start playing so we're actually going to jump in right now and we're going to do the income phase in wave one you can see at the top of that quick reference it says your income is five source so if you can both add five source onto your blue trackers okay and then the next thing is repair defeated fortress gates we don't need to worry about that the next phase is the market phase okay so in the market phase the first player which is andy you get to buy one thing from the market if you want to and then ian you may buy one thing from the market if you want to and then that's the end of the market phase. So let's have a look at the market over here and let's see what we have. I'm just gonna move this. Okay, now what I will tell you is that source, which is one of the two currencies in the game, source will accumulate and if you don't spend it, you can keep it. The other currency that I'm gonna mention later on, you can't do that. If you don't spend it, you lose it. But source is a currency that you, you can keep and you can store up. So you can buy any one of these chips here or you can buy the earthscape i'll talk about the chips first starting with the one on the left hand side 
because it's got circles with numbers in and I'm actually going to hold alt down on my machine so that people are, who are watching the stream can see it. The cost to buy rower is five source. And you can see that that is on the right hand side, the uppermost icon. That's how much it costs to buy rower. Rower has a gold background, which means rower is a hero. I'll come on to the rules for heroes later on, but that's what you can do. So if you wanted to buy rower, that would be it. That would be your one purchase and it would cost you all of your source. The next one is the elite duelist. You can't actually buy that because that costs six source. So that's actually going to disappear with the new rules. Uh, but that is a minion because it's got a copper border around the outside. And finally, the bunker is, uh, that's a spire. So that's a mercenary spire um, and that costs three source to buy that. The earthscape costs two source. Earthscapes always cost two source. And covering the rules for earthscapes briefly is you can place them on the board. And that allows you to basically modify various things. First of all, there's a source well on it, which can be useful. Uh, but also you see that there's two paths on that one. That can allow you to, you know, change routes. You can block off one route, open up another route, etc., etc. The restrictions are you cannot block off somebody's route to the center. So you can perform, you can form another one, that's fine, but you can't deliberately block off an entire path to somebody's fortress gate. The other rules about the Earthscape tiles, should you decide to buy that, is you can only place it on the board uh, on an island where you have what we call influence. And at the start of the game, each of you only has influence over the island which is nearest you. So you could, for example, Ian, if you decided to buy this, right, you are allowed to put it there because one of those hexes is over this island and you have influence over this island. So that, that, would, be, okay. that would be legal. You would not be able to put it there though, for example. Not that that actually does much, but yeah, you wouldn't be able to put it there because you don't have influence over this. And we'll talk about influence more later on and how you get influence over the other islands. But to start with, you only have that. You don't need to place this on the turn that you buy it. So if you really wanted to, you could buy it and save it for later. Now I said I was going to teach you the rules as we go along. So at this point, we should actually probably play the market phase and make you make those purchases. But that would be unfair because I need you to tell, I need to tell you what else you can spend your source on so that you don't blow it all at once in the market phase. So we're going to pause the game for the moment and I'm going to go back to the teach because the next phase is the build phase. And there are four things that you can do in the build phase. One of them is to construct a spire on the board. One of them is to upgrade a spire. One of them is to place an earthscape that you've previously built. And the fourth one is to advance your fortress. And all of those, apart from the placing an earthscape, cost source. So what you actually need to do right now, both Ian and Andy, is you need to have a think about what you want to do in the build phase and how much source you will have left, if any, to spend in the market phase. Or you might decide rower looks really cool. I'll buy that and I won't actually buy anything in the build phase. So let's briefly talk about the four things that you can do in the build phase. First one is construct a spire. The game is called Cloud Spire. Spires are a big part of the game. You can only build a spire on a source well that you have influence over. Each player has two source wells. It's not that clear from the actual uh, image, but each player has two spaces on their board where they can build spires. At the moment, you cannot build spires anywhere else because you can only build spires on source wells once the landmark has gone. So if you were to construct a spire at this point in the game, it would be purely on your base. And the reason you would do that is to protect your base from when the enemy arrives, which is going to happen at some point unless you play very aggressively and manage to, to do very well. Upgrading a spires, we'll talk about that once we have some spires on the board. Placing an earthscape we've kind of mentioned. So advancing your fortress. Now, Ian and Andy, the sheets that I sent you last night, um, let's just flip over Ian's. Oh no, it is that one. These are, so each faction has a whole list of all of the different fortress advancements that it can have. They're divided into groups uh, and within each group, you have to buy them in order. So if we look at Ian's, for example, if you wanted to, you could, you could upgrade your academy peak to level one at the start of the game, that would cost you four source. So if you definitely wanted to do that, you don't want to buy anything from the market. Uh, or you could buy Gateport, or you could buy the Stables, or the Kaze Roost, or the Airstrip, or the Sanctuary. Or you might decide to buy none of them. Um, 
And the way that this game is going to work is during a game, you will not be able to buy all of these. So not only are the factions all very different, each time you play with a particular faction, you can change what, you know, how you play that faction. And each faction can be played a number of different ways. And the way that you play that faction may well depend on the other faction that you're playing against. Now, you two are brand new to the game, so you've no idea. But I'm sure Mark's thinking, oh yeah, if I was playing the Heirs versus Brawnen, I'd probably be wanting this particular thing because that's good against them. Don't worry about that for now because it's going to be a learning game. Um, right. Do you have enough information to be able to decide if you want to buy something from the market or not? If not, I can explain more. Um, I, I think I'm okay. Okay. Uh, what's the significance of this The little blue dot? That's a source well. Yeah, so if I were to have a source well near me, how does that... How does that help? Do I get it means you can build spires it? on it. Build spires on it. Yeah. And, and something I think Paul didn't mention is during the build phase when you're placing a spire, when you're placing an earthscape, as the same build option, you can construct a spire on it before your opponent gets a turn. You are correct. I didn't mention that. And it is important because otherwise you take a turn to place an earthscape and the other player goes, oh, look, a source well. I'll have a spire there. So yeah, <laughs> they can't do that. that. It is placing an earthscape and constructing a spire on it if you want to as part of one action. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the numbers on these uh, chips, for those people watching, by the way, and also for Ian and Andy, the number in the top left with the heart is how, many, how much health it has. The orange one with the sword is its attack value, and the green number is its movement value. And on the bottom right, the other uh, source icon is how much source the other player will get for killing that unit. Defeating, not killing. This is a, this Sorry. Is a family channel. Oh, yes. Defeating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so who did we decide was the first player? It was Andy, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 All right, go on. I'm going to buy the tile. You are going to buy the tile. So you just take that tile and put it in front of you. That is, uh, that is next to your barracks. Now, the oh, official rules of the game are that you're supposed to reveal the next Earthscape tile now, but nobody can actually buy it this turn. Only one Earthscape is allowed to be bought uh, per round. But yeah, the rules are that you're supposed to reveal the next one already. So that costs you two source if you drop your source down by two. And then, Ian, do you want to buy anything or not? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Right. Now... We're playing with the new errata today, so they have updated the rules since the game came out. Um, and at the start of each market phase, all of the market chips are going to disappear. They didn't used to, but they are going to—they're going to disappear at the start of the next market phase. Right. So that's the market phase done. We're now into the build phase. So again, in the build phase, Andy, you're the start player. You get to do one build action, and then Ian gets to do one build action. The difference between the build phase and the market phase is that it continues. So you can both have as many goes as you want. But as soon as you both pass, that's that's when the uh, that's when the phase ends. So Andy, you've got three source left. Would you like to build something? Uh, I guess I probably should. Yes. Okay. Uh, right. Let's let's build one of these battleborn. Ah, awesome. right. Now these are units. You don't build these. Uh, okay. So your four build options are constructing a spire, upgrading a spire, placing an earthscape, or buying a fortress advancement. Uh, okay, so it's not the units. We'll come to the units in a second. Want... Um, what do these little numbers on these spires do? So the spires, the numbers on the left-hand side of the spires show its attack value and its range, but the range is actually plus one. So the default range of a spire is always one. Yeah. And what that that green number with the spears is, it means it's going to have one range chip atta attached to the spire which is effectively plus one range. So the dispatch platform has got an attack value of one and an effective range of two. And what it's going to do is it's going to sit there on the board uh, and it's going to attack your opponents as, as they come towards it. Okay, that sounds fun. But that and does that... cost four source to buy. And you've only got three. Yeah. The other one is three and that has a shield of one or something? Yeah, so the drilling outpost, uh, basically it's got... It's got one fortification ship, so it's got one hit point. It doesn't attack, 
uh, but it has the ability of mining. And if we flip your chart over, you can see that mining means that at the end of the wave, you may return this spire to the barracks to gain six source. So you basically spend three source to build yeah. it, and then at the end of the wave, it generates you six source. If it's not been killed, I guess. Uh, correct, yes. And I have no idea how likely that is. Well, the only place you can build it right now is on your fortress. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's tricky. Uh, I, I, from my experience, it doesn't happen that often that uh, an enemy gets all the way to your fortress on the first wave. Now, I'm not saying never, because I'm sure when I played Mark, he'd half killed me by the end of wave one. But uh, yeah, you don't have that many units in wave one. Also, okay. another thing about fortifications on spires that's important is that it takes at least two damage to do to uh, actually damage it. Yeah. So your opponent can't just attack it with uh, something that only has one attack. If it... Yeah, a fortification ship is, um, as, as Mark says, it's uh, yeah, it's harder to remove than normal than a normal ship. But you are taking a gamble. If you do buy the drilling outpost, you're saying, okay, I'll, I'll spend three source now, but I'm going to have loads of source next round. Or sorry, next wave. Well, how about instead of that, I will go for a fortress advancement and buy the source drill level one. Yep, so source drill level one. So you spend three source. And what we do is we take one of these little pegs from here. Uh, and the great thing, one of the great things with this mod is that that peg will snap into the appropriate point. So source drill mm -hmm. level one is over here. Okay. So you're currently winning the game, Andy, because yeah, you yeah. now have 11 points as opposed to Ian's 10. Because <laughs> remember, every peg is worth one point if the game ends at the end of the fourth wave with neither player being defeated. Uh, okay, so Ian, your build phase. And you have five okay. source. Um I do. I, I, I can only build one of these advancements. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can with one build action, you can build one advancement. Play will then pass to Andy, right. who will likely pass. Or you could put the Earthscape on the board, right. but you might not. And then it'll come back to you. Okay. You can have as many build actions as you want in the build phase. Okay. Um, lots of options. Yeah, while you're I thinking think of that, I'm, I'm do... just going to put the chat on screen. Okay, I think I'm going to build the first level of the Sanctuary for three points. Yeah. Gives me a Command Eye, which helps increase my CP, providing the dice don't hate me. Yeah, no, in fact, I tell you what, I'm not going to put the chat on screen. Because putting the chat on screen, I'm not going to see it anyway, because I'm in Tabletop Simulator. I will just occasionally Alt-Tab... Uh, and say hello to people in the chat. But the chat's fairly quiet, but yeah, thank you for people for joining in. Um, but nobody's got any messages for me there. But yeah, thank you for watching. Right, sorry, I, uh, sorry Ian, what were you saying? Um, I'm going to build the first level of the Sanctuary, I think, and get me uh, the Command Die. Right, okay. And so you, uh, you've got Unified Front, you gain the Command Die. Now, it's not clear, because this is a bad scan in, which one of those the Command Die is. Um, let me have a look at the actual physical sheet. Uh, it's the gold one. Yeah, so that's yours. And that basically slots into your... Uh, there. Okay. Almost. Is it going to fit in? Yeah, that's near enough. Okay. Uh, and what does that command die do? Uh, once per wave during the prep phase, you roll it and you'll get extra command points. Okay, there you go. Or, or not. Or not. Yeah, or not. Right. Back to and don't give it, don't bring it your peg. Back to Andy. Okay, so I have enough yeah. source left, so I'm, nope. I'm pretty limited on my options. Um, for this tile, if we assume that I'm not particularly fussed about moving any of the paths at the moment, mm -hmm. and I'm obviously not going to build a tower spire either, um, is there any other reason why I might want to put it down? Uh, I'll ask Mark that. <laughs> You can use it to change the path of the minions. So, um, you have this tile here. You could place it like, uh, you know, you could you could place it over here so that you can like get this avenue, or uh, you could block off this top path over here 
so that he's not allowed to move up on the, along the side and he has to move down along the side. Okay. Um, I will leave it for now until I've yep. got a better idea of how this flows, I think. Yep. Yep. So you pass back over to you, Ian. Um, I'm not entirely sure how useful that sub negotiator is going to be. So I think I'm going to pass as well. Yeah, you're going to keep your two source. That's fine. Okay, so that's yeah. the end of the build phase. We now go into the prep phase. So the first thing that you do in the prep phase is you declare your mark. Now in a two player game, you don't need to do that because your mark is the other player's fortress. But if you were playing this game multiplayer, this is the point where every player needs to declare their mark. So what you do is you take your little mark chip and you say, right, we're going for there. And then we take yours, Andy, and we say, you're going for there. Okay, but if this was multiplayer, you know, you could have everybody going for the same person if you wanted to. There's a little bit of negotiation. And this is going to determine uh, the movement of the minions because the minions in this game, you don't have full control over where they move. They move towards their mark in order to try and defeat it. So in a two-player game, you kind of don't need to bother doing that because, um, yeah, your mark is the other player. The next thing to do is to select units using command points. Okay, so this is where we've introduced the second currency in the game, which is called command points. And there is no way of tracking command points because you spend them now or lose them. And in wave one, you see at the top there, uh, you will have five command points. Now, Ian, do you want to roll your dice at this point to see if you get extra? Absolutely do. It's uh, R to roll it's the R dice. to roll it. Okay. And that is a, looks like a one. One. Okay, so you have six command points to spend. Now, let's just have a look at Ian's units. Um, so we've already seen a number of things. We've seen the health value, the attack value. Uh, we've seen the movement value. The command point cost to buy the unit is shown on the top right, and it's the yellow fist. That is how many command points it costs to buy the unit. Now, each of you starts with a hero. There are three heroes in the game. And on wave one, uh, the heirs have to start with Darb. You have no choice, okay? That is yours. It costs you zero. But I'm going to move it aside from the barracks now. That is your starting hero. And in fact, all of the factions work like that. They have three heroes and they have to start with the cheapest one. Except until the Errata came out, okay? And the Errata in the game for the Brawnen is specifically for playing one-on-one -on -one versus the heirs. And in wave one, Andy, you can actually deploy any one of your heroes. And the reason for that is the Brawnen are quite weak against aerial units, okay? And the heirs are birds and they have a number of aerial units. So what it meant was that the Brawnen against the heirs, it could be quite a really bad matchup because there wasn't really that much protection. So what they've done for the Brawnen is they've said, instead of taking Orsh, which is the one that you would normally get, you could actually buy one of the other ones. And I think, Mark, am I right in thinking that Andy should probably buy Drang? Uh, that's that's uh, his choice. Um, yeah. Because if you, if you buy Drang, it's the only thing you're buying. Because you do still have to spend the source to, the yeah. command points to, yeah. to buy him. And the reason why we're saying Drang is Drang has the talent of two range. And in order to fight against an aerial unit, you need to have uh, either the ability of airstrike. Is it airstrike? Air defense. Air defense, that's it. Um, or range. So any unit that has range can fight against uh, a flying unit. So, yeah, if you wanted to buy Drang, if you didn't, and, he and here's the risk, the heirs have a particularly strong unit called the Royal Talon, which costs five source to buy. There's only one of them in the game, it costs five source. So Ian could buy that on round one. And if he does, and you don't buy Drang, you are in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I believe that this, this purchase is actually supposed to be done in secret. And then after you've done it, you'll then reveal what you're each going to buy. Okay, so with that in mind, I should probably just get Drang then. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably the safest thing to do. Okay, so what you do is you just take Drang and just move it to the left of your barracks or something to say, yeah, that that's the one that I'm buying. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, in general, I think for a learning game, 
it's usually best just to say not to deploy the royal talent okay. as a friendly thing. Okay. Just because it it does limit players' options a lot, and okay. it could be quite unfun. Right. Okay. But, Okay, let's take that. Let's back do that then. then. Okay, so Ian's going to promise not to buy the Royal Talon. <laughs> I, I have my fingers crossed. I, 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 I hope you saw that. <laughs> okay, so yes, it, technically this is supposed to be done in secret, and then you will reveal what you've bought. But if you've got any right. questions, yeah, let me know. Just, just a quick question. Yep. So Andy's got a, a couple of units there uh, that have got range. So he's got the Source Siege and the Dispatch. Right. So they if are one of those. Would that be just as effective? So these are not units. These are spires. No, not not the spires. The dispatch, are, there, yeah. are there spires in oh, the sorry. second row as well? Yes, dispatch. Yes. So he's got two units there as well that also have range. Yeah. Is there a difference? So um, the, the go on, Mark. So the so the problem with the Royal Town Wave One against the Bronin is that they didn't have any air spires, uh, air defense spires that they could deploy. And you are right in that they do have the dispatch unit that can attack the Royal Talon. The problem is that when you when you figure out uh, how combat works in this game, the Royal Talon has three attack. So when it attacks the dispatch, the dispatch will simply die. And since the dispatch is a minion, it is forced to move forward where Drang is a hero, which means she has total movement, uh, total control of her movement. Right. So Drang can move behind the royal talent and then chase it as it comes as it comes towards the fortress where the dispatch will either die or just walk away from the royal talent okay thank you so i think i'm right in saying that on wave one you can only have one hero after wave one you are allowed two heroes but you're never allowed more than two heroes at any time but for wave one, you're only allowed your first starting hero. You can't choose another one. So again, in a similar way that what I was explaining about the fortress upgrades, every time you play the game, even with the same faction, you can choose different fortress upgrades and it'll play out very differently. It's the same with the units. You know, you've got so much choice over which units you buy and there are different strategies that you can play with each faction and the units that you buy will sort of determine what, what strategy you decide to play which was over my head for at least three or four games, and he's probably still over my head already. Anyway, so. So given this uh, Cram the Mighty costs seven and I only get five points in round one, how do you get him? In wave two, you get seven. And in wave mm -hmm. three, you get nine. And in wave four, you get 11. And you can just re what, replace a hero in a different wave, or would you have to go without one in round one? Um, no, you, you can have two heroes maximum at any time. Okay. So I'll let, I'll let you buy yourselves, but if you've got any questions, we can ask them. Uh, right, I've got five points left. Um, Again, we're simulating two people sat down, learning the game for the first time, who have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> such as life. Yes. So is if it you do just... have any friends who have Cloudspire, the best way to learn is to, is to get them to teach you. Is it just video. units I can purchase with command points? Just units. Now, a unit is a hero or a minion. Both heroes yeah. and minions together are called units. And they'll go at the end of the round, so there's no point holding yeah. back. I'm there's no point saving different. command points. So I'll, let's just buy a Battleborn and a Dispatch. To yeah. go that doesn't mean you have to spend them all. Sometimes you will, because you know the units that you want might cost four, you just, you just waste the extra one. Yeah. Like if we were playing a, a serious, you know, competitive game, Ian probably would buy the Royal Talon in the hope that you didn't buy Drank. Okay, so Ian, any thoughts? Uh, I was just trying to have a read of what this Elfin does on the, the Humminger. Yep. Um, so, what I'm seeing is that I can put one of those Elfin cars in, which yep. doesn't have a cost. So yeah, if, if what, uh, that, so is that like just spawning a unit? What yep. does that do for him? So Elfin Kazi is a little bird, okay? So the Humminger will come into play, yeah. and at the start of the onslaught phase, you take one of the Elfin Kazis, you put it on top of the Humminger, 
and it's like there's guys walking around and he's got this bird sat in his shoulder and the bird can go off there's two types of elf in Kazi. when you put it into play you can choose if it's the the bombing one or the healing one um, and then at some point the elf in Kazi will you know get off his shoulder fly away drop a bomb on somebody and that 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 happens at the start of every onslaught phase he gets an elf in Kazi. is essentially okay. very basically how it works when he says the start of the oh, onslaught uh, phase that's the that's the start of the the changing turns so it's once per wave yeah okay well let's have one of those then mm -hmm. and let's have two harriers okay so you've spent your six and he spent his five right the next thing to do is once you've selected the units you prepare those units into a deployment stack so all of the units that you've just bought are all going to come into play on your fortress gate and they come into play so we need to get some health chips at this point if everybody wants to take health chips so let's take your uh humminger for example it starts with three health so what we do is we we put it in there like that okay that will be three health and what I'm going to do, just for the purposes of teaching, I'm actually going to show you how you would stack these up in one particular way of doing it. But there are other ways you can do it. Uh, so that would be that. That would be that. One, two, three. All right, be that. So right. the, these chips are going to glitch on the two. See? Yeah. Uh, oh. So, so the way you, you fix that is you put three and then to take a third one off. Take the third one off. All oh, right, because I saw that in your video, and you said, "Oh, it sometimes does that." Oh uh, yeah, I found out that it's uh, specifically with two. Specifically with two, so you have to put three on, and then take one off. How odd! How very odd. Right. So here's the units with their health chips. Oh, uh, except yeah, we need to take that one out. There we go. Okay. So there's the units with their health chips. So one way that you can stack them is you can put the uh, minions all together. In whatever order you want and the order is important uh, and they can go on your fortress gate and then you can put the hero either on the top or on the bottom oh it looks like it's reorganized them yeah that's a slight glitch isn't it <laughs> Don't know how uh, that can happened. you promote me Paul I can so yeah. I can so you can, can uh, copy paste things too it. There you go. Yeah, you so with the. Uh, yeah, you'll want to um, put things on more at a time and set it in a big stack. Right, okay. So, yeah, so you can put all of, the, all of the minions in a big stack in whatever order you want, and then your hero can either go on top of the stack or on the bottom, but it cannot go in the middle, okay? So, that's one thing that you can do. Now, if you have. If you, if you do that, then every single unit in that stack is acting as an independent unit and what they will do is they will move one at a time the one on the top of the stack will move first then the next one then the next one and then the next one so on and so forth okay so what you're determining is you're actually determining the order in which they're going to come out of your fortress gate and how they're going to move but each one acts completely independently and follows the normal rules your other option is what's called grouping the units together now if you group things together what happens let's say we decide to group both of the harriers together well i've done that wrong camera okay there we go if we were to group both of the harriers together what we would do is we'd actually do that okay so there would be a harrier underneath the harrier would be another harrier and then the health chips that it has is equal to whatever's on the top okay now what this does is if it's grouped it will move and act as one unit and it is just the unit that's on the top which is the active one and it will move around and it will do its thing and if you hit it its health goes once its health is, and, and the unit that's underneath is effectively inactive it's not doing anything whatsoever but then what happens is once the once the, the top harrier has been killed or defeated and it's lost all of its health then what happens is the next one appears with its health 
And again, it's going to take you a game or two, or at least a few rounds to work out, oh yeah, I see why I should have grouped those units, or I should have not grouped those units. There's definitely advantages and disadvantages, but they will move together as a group, and then when the first one dies, the second one basically takes its place. You can group together uh, minions of different types, they don't have to be the same type, but you cannot group a slower unit underneath a faster unit, because that would be cheating, because then the slower unit would be, you know, getting the movement points of the faster unit. For your first round, I would just do something, and then we'll play it out, and we'll see what happens. But it would be kind of nice if, if at least one of you did some grouping, and, some, and then the other one maybe did not do the grouping, just so that we see, uh, yeah, the different ways that it plays. Okay. Is the hero group with the other units as well? Uh, no. No, it's only minions that can be grouped together. I will say that so, grouping got... is usually defensive and uh, not grouping is usually offensive. Okay. So I've got two units that have got four movement and two units that have got to you, to me. Yep. Will they stack on each other when they move? So, uh, minions won't move through each other. So if you were to put the Humminger first, what would happen is the Harriers would effectively kind of get blocked behind. Stack, stack up behind it, okay. Yeah, and they, they end up stacking up behind it. Now, heroes are slightly different. Um, your heroes will not get in the way of your minions' movement. In fact, what happens is if one of your minions tries to move onto a space with one of your heroes, the hero is displaced and, and the units actually swap round. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then. Um... While you're thinking about it, there's a couple of other things that I'll just I'll just mention to you. I'm um, just looking at the units that you've bought. There's no terrain icons on these units. What that means is that these units can only move on path. So all the different terrain types that are in the game, the Harrier and the Humminger, can only move on this path. Uh, whereas Darb is flying, so Darb can actually go wherever. Um, and what did what did Andy buy? Andy bought path, path. Right. So Orsh. You notice he's got a terrain icon on him of forest. Well, that means he can move on path and plains and forest. So the, the way the terrain icons work is that there is, a, there is a table on the quick reference sheet. And you can see that if they've got forest, they can also move on grassland and also move on path. So... Now, how do you do this, Mark, when you're playing the physical game? Do you kind of stack them up on your fortress gate and put your hand in front of it so the other player can't see you? Well, technically, uh, while, while the current rulebook is simultaneously, the FAQ is, has clarified that the, the way you do it is that the first player in turn order reveals what they're doing, or what they're uh, playing, but they don't have to reveal the order that they're playing it in. So you right. don't have to reveal what your groups are. And I personally just use the, the mark chip since it's a two-player game and I'm not, I'm not using the marks anyway. I just put the mark chip on top. Okay. This is what I'm thinking, Paul. Mm -hmm. I've got I've got these three um, source wells. These landmarks, yeah. Directly in front of me. So I've got two units that can move I can't remember how to put the little arrows on the tab. Uh, on the board. Tab. tab. Tab will do the arrow. Oh, I've got a shiny arrow. Right. So, so those, so my two four units should be in the, these two squares. Yep. And then my two two units will stack up behind them. Mm -hmm. So potentially I'll be exploring three of these. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. If you want to, you might not want to explore all of them because some of them might be bad, but. <laughs> well, we'll find that out. Yep. 
it could be a very quick and short game. Okay, in which case then, let's... Uh, this is going to fall end up all over the place, I can tell. And remember, the hero can't go in the middle. It can either go on the top or the bottom. Yeah, well, it looks like he's going on the bottom. Okay. Wait till we get to wave four when you've got 11 command points to spend. Oh, it didn't like that oh, at all, did it? It, it nearly went. <laughs> it nearly went. Yeah. yeah. I think we might have to. Uh, there's obviously some kind of glitch with the mod. But we might have to stack them up no, in a different the, way. The, the chips are too thin, uh, so it, it tries to to stack them together because it thinks that the it's one group. Right. Okay. Well, Andy's done his, so he's got the hero on top, followed by a group of a group of two units. Great. Uh, the hummingbird was on top, or was it on the bottom frame? Um. The. It was on the bottom, I think. I think I got. I, I, it was. It was on the bottom. So I'd got the dog, the hummingbird, and then the two. Um, Gotcha. The Harriers were on top, weren't they? Harriers, yeah. Yeah. I think maybe just move them so that they're in separate. <laughs> oh no, you you just have to place them one at a time. That's all. Oh okay, right. If you if you drop them, then it like bounces and then creates one stack. Oh, okay. There we go. Right. Okay. So that is the deployment bit. While Mark sorts that out. Um, again, very tactical, and there are yeah lots of choices to make at that particular point, and it will have a big difference as we're, as we're going to see. Uh, so the next thing we go into is the onslaught phase. Now the onslaught phase is going to last for ages because all of these other phases so far have actually been you know <coughs> relatively short. The onslaught phase is the main part of the game. The onslaught phase is actually divided into a series of turns, and we keep repeating those turns over and over and over again until the onslaught phase ends and then it's the end of the wave. So in the onslaught phase, there are five steps. Andy's going to go first, he's going to do start of turn. There are certain things in the game that you can do at the start of your turn. Then his stuff will move. Then enemy spires, if they are in range, will attack. Then exploration happens and then you actually do your attack. And then it's the end of your turn, play passes to the other player, they do their turn, then play passes back to Andy, he does his turn, etc, etc, etc. Now the wave ends, and this is the rule that I always get wrong. Oh no, it's campfire that's the rule that I always get wrong. The wave ends when all minions have gone. So just minions. The heroes, if, the, if they're still in play, but all of the minions have gone, the wave ends. And the wave ends, I believe it's immediately. Uh, but heroes have a thing called campfire mode that we'll explain later on. But basically, yeah, uh, the wave, the, the onslaught phase is going to go back and forth, back and forth until all of the minions have gone, and then immediately the wave ends. Okay, so Andy, we have for the first thing we have for you is we have your start of turn. Now there is something that you can do at the start of your turn um, called a limited build option. And I'm going to mention it briefly now, but if you look at your fortress, there are actually two little holes right at the bottom of the base. They are for a limited build option. So twice in each wave, at the start of your turn, you can say, I'm going to do a limited build option. Uh, and it's, it's sort of similar in a way to a normal build action, except you cannot upgrade your fortress. But what, what it's normally used for is building spires, or sorry, constructing spires, in the middle of the onslaught phase once you've got some source so that's that's what it's normally used for or upgrading spires if you need to repair them if they were damaged or or something like that um can you place an earthscape in the onslaught phase mark i don't think you can can you you cannot no there we go right so andy because you've got no source you don't do anything at the start of your turn and now we go into movement so the rules on movement are if you have a stack, the things in that stack will move in order from top to bottom. And the first thing in your stack, Andy, is Orsh, the hero. And heroes, you actually have free control of movement. Uh, apart from, you must leave the fortress gate if you can. Other than that, he can move two spaces, and he can move on path, uh, plains, or forest. And in this particular case, 
he's got the mountains here, so he can only go either here or here. Nope. 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 He's left some health behind. Okay, right, so that's your hero done. Uh, the next thing is your units will move, but they, they don't have complete freedom of movement. They must move towards their mark, which is the opponent's fortress gate. Uh, they will move all of their movement if possible. Uh, and uh, they've got to make progress. So they've got to end their turn, if possible, closer to their mark than when they started. So in this particular case, they want to move two. They can't move two because the hero's in the way. But if you remember what I was saying, your own heroes do not block your own minions' movement. So what's going to happen is your hero is going to get displaced. There you go. Okay. And that is movement done. Nice and simple. If Ian now had any spires within range of your units, they would now attack you. He doesn't. So you now go to exploration. But you're too far away. So exploration, you must be adjacent in order to be able to explore it. Okay, so we're going to skip that part. And then we do attack, but there's nothing for you to attack. So that is the end of your turn. Right, Ian, it is your turn. Look at this ginormous stack. Okay. <laughs> so again, start of turn effect. You do have two source. So if you wanted to at this stage, if you had a spire that cost two source to build, you don't. But if you did, you could actually build a spire right now. Okay. Um, so let's go to your movement. So on top we have a Harrier. The Harrier is a minion, so you do not have full control of movement. And I am stressing the word full because yeah. there are some clever things that you can do. Right, it must move four if it can. But here's what you can do. You could, if you wanted to, go one, two, three, four. Right? You could do that. Or you could go one, two, three, four. Because both of those end up closer to your mark than when you started. Or, and this is where it actually gets really clever, you could go one, two, three, four. And that is absolutely legal, okay? You can send a unit on a scenic route in order to end up in a slightly different place than if it, if it would if it took a direct path. Um, Mark, am I right in thinking that it must use all of its movement if it can? Yes. Right, okay, because there are rules for the solo game where the AI movement is slightly different, but yeah. So it must move four, it must end up closer to its mark uh, than when it started. Oh, and it can't use the same space more than once, so it can't go one, two, you know, three, four. And then right, 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 it, it, Yeah, it can't go round in circles on the same space. So with that in mind, where would you like to end your movement with the Harrier? I think... So my first Harrier could potentially finish here. It could, yeah. And my second one could finish behind him. Yeah, second one can finish behind it. Um, so yeah, you could either... So what you're saying is if you want it to finish here, yeah, then what you're saying is it's going to go one... It's in the little two three four and if right. this pa if this path here the wiggly edge path wasn't there you would have to end up there right okay yeah um, um oh we forgot to put the um, the elfin kazi on well i hadn't forgotten about him i was just waiting until he turned up because okay yeah the stacking on top of that loss would have caused problems <laughs> yes <laughs> So the two sides to the Elfin Kazi are, yeah, as I mentioned, one side is a glide bomb, so it'll basically take off, fly over to some enemy units, drop a bomb and blow it up. Or the other ability is it's got save, which I think is healing. Uh, before or after this unit's movement, it may defeat itself in order for an adjacent unit to recover up to four health. Yeah. So which of those would you like? Oh, wow. Um, we'll go with glide bomb. Okay, so what we do is we put that on top of there. Now, the reason why in the mod they have done it as a smaller chip, whereas in the physical game they are actually the same size, is this kind of breaks the rules on grouping. So this is not a group of units, okay? The Elfin Kazi is a separate unit that actually sits on top of the Humminger. Right. Okay, well, 
We want the Humminger then to move forward to two spaces. Yep. I'm just going to get this out and have a read through it. And then my hero to come in just behind here. Mm -hmm. Now your hero has got flying uh, and it has the, the terrain type of your hero is water which basically means it can move over any type of terrain you want to. Okay. Yeah, so you yeah. could move it further if you wanted to, but you might want to leave it there. Um, I'm hoping that there's a bit of kindness in these tiles, given that two of them are swampy tiles. Yep. Um, and that, that I can at least take control of one of them and get yep. some benefit out of it. Okay. So now Andy spires fire at you, but he doesn't have any. Okay, so now we go to the exploration phase. Oh, sorry, the exploration step. So exploration is optional. You don't have to do it. If you do it, you must be adjacent to whatever it is you're exploring. And what you do is you move your mouse over it. You hold down the alt button. And then you press shift. And that allows you to look at the other side without Andy seeing what's on the other side. Now, just be aware... Okay some of the landmarks have the talent engage if you see a tile that has the word engage on it you must reveal it and then there will be a fight otherwise okay you will look at what it does on this big sheet over here in the top right this is landmark talents uh yeah so just this side here you will look at what it does and then you will decide whether to leave it face down or to reveal it so exploration and revealing are two separate things. But if it has the word engage, you must reveal it. You must reveal it. Okay. So which one of those first do you want to have a look at? And I'll have a look at it with you. Um, the one nearest my okay. base, I think. So as long as Andy's not watching the YouTube stream. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody at home can see that. And it does not okay. have the engaged talent. So you can choose whether you want to reveal it or not. Oh uh, yeah, so Ian is now having a look at this. Yeah. So let's have another quick look at what his stuff And the, the blue circle in the bottom right with the chest, that's how much source you will get if you defeat it. Okay. As well as it then being removed from the board, which means it's a source well that you can then build spires on. Right. Okay. So let's have a quick look at my units here. So if I reveal this now, Paul... Yep, you just flip it over. Just flip it over and mm -hmm. then the attacks and stuff will happen later? Yes. Yep. So if I don't flip it over now and move on, I don't have to encounter that one? Correct. But that's the only one at the moment that I've got any influence over and could build on. Oh no, uh, this one in the corner as well. Yeah. Now when we get to attacks, your minions, because they're stupid, um, your minions must attack it. So if, if it's something that can be attacked, uh, your minions yeah. must attack if they have a valid target. Okay. Right. I'll risk it of IDIT to learning games at the risk of giving things away. Yep. So this fair fight, is yep. that attack stat going to change for each of my units? Yes. Yeah, if you hit it for one, Sorry. it will hit you back for one. So, uh, okay. I think the question is, so, uh, units will only retaliate once. So, whatever right. you attack with it first will take retaliation, but anything you attack with it afterwards will not be attacked. Yeah. Back. Oh, it only gets one attack per turn? It gets one retaliation per turn. Right. So, for example, if you attack it with Darb, you will deal one damage to it. It will deal one damage back to you because of fair fight. You can then attack it with as many other things as you want to, and it, it's already had its retaliation. 
Right. So I could start with El Finkazi. Basically sacrifice that for one, one point of damage each. You could. Well, no, it's got that glide bomb, isn't it? Yeah, I'd be tempted to save the glide bomb. Well, he's going to die anyway, and I get a new one next turn. Or am I best off stacking those things next and then wave. launching a massive next attack? Wave. Yeah, next wave, not next turn. So the Elfin Kazi is at the start of the onslaught phase, at the very start of the onslaught phase, which we've had. Yeah, so I get one per wave. That was my understanding. My, my terminology is obviously right. Like, yeah. But yeah, one, one, Turns one waves. per wave was my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay then, but I want to finish him off with Darby. Is that correct? I seem to say, remember seeing that in one of your videos. Yeah, there are. Uh, if if, if you finish it off, seen him off, absolutely right. If you finish it off with a hero, the hero basically gets to level up. The the hero will gain either an extra attack or an extra health, or if it's a ranged hero, it can also gain an extra range. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. In terms of the maths, I've got to do four damage to it. This. Yep. How many times does combat repeat just until something is dead? Just once. Once each turn. So, the minions are going to attack anyway, aren't they? Is that what you said? Yeah, if you reveal this, the minions have a target and therefore will attack it if possible. So if you were to declare that the Humminger is attacking first, you would deal two to it, it would deal two back to you. Which wouldn't then, kill you. No. And then kill it off with the other two. Yeah. Okay, let's let's do that then. Okay, so that's been right. revealed. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to get four health chips. Okay, and we'll put that on there. There we go. Right, now do you want to explore any of the other ones? Um, yeah, let's explore the other swampy one. Okay. Oh, I'm going to flip that over because it's got the word engage. Okay. okay. Oh, there you go. How did you do that? <laughs> How did you get four health on it and keep it on top really easily? Uh, witchcraft. Also, if you hold, if you're holding onto the chip and you paste, it'll face through it. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, that's going to save a lot of time. Okay, so yeah, this is a big nasty thing, um, which has got four health, one attack. I mean, there are worse, um, but it is worth. I thought you said the, the swampy, uh, the swampy ones were kind. <laughs> no, well, no, ones? they're all bad. <laughs> <laughs> I said the swampy ones are good as first ones. Oh, trust me, there's a lot worse than this in the game. These, these are the easy ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> these are the easy ones. Right, well, we'll, well, we'll leave that other bugger alone for now, then, yeah. shall we? Okay, right. Nice. So, now we go to attacks. Okay, so... Start, starting out over here with the... Um, with the Humminger. Yeah. So the Humminger basically takes two damage as retaliation because of the fair fight talent. Yeah. You, you deal two to it. So that's its retaliation. It, it's done. You then attack it with the Elfin Kazi. It's gone. Then you attack it with Darb. And that's it. Just a quick note about retaliation. If it only had one health left, okay, uh, and you attacked it with Darb, it would not retaliate, even if it hadn't retaliated yet that turn. Because, yeah, the, the, the attack and the damage go yeah. first. So the Bounty Hunter is gone, and you get three source. There you go. You can have three swords in your little thing. And because a hero dealt the final blow, uh, as Mark says, the hero can basically get uh, an upgrade. So you can either take an attack chip, which will increase Darb's attack from one to two, 
or you can increase, uh, you can give it a fortification chip, which effectively gives it an extra hit point. Uh, there is another type of upgrade that you can have, which is a range, but you can only add a range upgrade to a hero that has the ranged ability. So, okay. what do you want? A hit point or an extra attack? Um, let's have a hit point for him. Okay, so we take a fortification upgrade. And there we go. Now, if you look very, very carefully at Darb, you see on the left, bottom left-hand side there's a blue dot. That one blue dot means that Darb is limited to having one upgrade chip. So he has one upgrade chip, he can't have any more. But if Darb had four dots, right. you could actually upgrade him four times. Now, that doesn't mean that defeating something else isn't useful because another thing that the hero can do is they can level up. A hero can only level up when they were due to get an upgrade and they've already got their maximum number of upgrades. So if Darb was to defeat something else now, he would actually level up, which means he would flip over and you would lose all of the upgrade chips that he currently has. So that is an improved version of Darb, uh, where he's basically got an extra ability called Dodge, which is awesome. Okay. So that's leveling up heroes. But for now, it's just normal Darb, but he's got an extra hit point on. Okay. Uh, and that is the end of that attack. Now over here, we have the Harrier, which attacks the Traxia Loner for one. So one health chip comes off that. And then the Traxia Loner attacks and does one back. And fun fact about these, these particular health chips, you can actually draw them since the Tabletop Simulator thinks of it as a deck. So if oh, you press okay. the number of the of the chips that you don't want anymore, you can actually just draw them into your hand. Oh, right. And okay, cool. Now, the Harrier does have a talent of Quick Strike. Uh, and Quick Strike is actually uh, only I relevant when we have the Spires. Yeah, so normally it's you move, the Spires attack, and then you attack. But Quick Strike means that you actually attack before the Spires. Right, so that's the end of Ian's turn. Back to Andy. Now, at this point, you have a choice, Andy. Your hero can either move before all of your minions or afterwards. Even though it's further back, you can, you can choose to move your heroes first. Okay, um, I'll just move the hero first then. He's going to mm -hmm. go, yeah. He's going to go one, two. Now your um, minion moves and we have the displacement again. So oh, the heroes I don't move through. I thought these move too, don't they? They do. Why but, do they displace if they're going past? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you probably want to move the minions first and then move the hero afterwards. Yeah, uh, okay. So displacement is if they move through, not just if they finish on him. Correct. Go on, Mark, you're saying something? Yeah, heroes don't... Uh, the Asha wouldn't have been able to move through like that anyway. Oh, true, you yes. can't move through your units. Yeah, heroes can't move through units, but units can sort of move through their heroes by displacing them. Yeah, okay. okay. Right, I'm assuming you want to explore. Yeah. Ian's having all the fun at the moment. <laughs> so I'm going to take a peek at it. Do you want to reveal it? Looks pretty nasty, but yeah, let's do it. See what happens. Okay. There you go. So yeah, it's it's quite tough, but it is worth. So, right, hang on, Mark. I'm going to try and do this. So I hold that, and then I go one, two, three, four, five. Nice. Okay, there you go. So yeah, Source Peddler. Five health, two attack. Um, but it is worth six Source if you kill it. Okay. And now it is attacked. So who do you want to attack it first? Remember, it's going to retaliate against the first attack for two. <laughs> the Battleborn will hit it. Okay, so the Battleborn hit it for one. Nope. There we go. Uh, and then it hits the Battleborn back. I'm trying to drag the health chip out. It's not doing it. Okay. He, he's yeah, using right. the non counting health chips. He's using the normal ones. That's why. Oh, there's different ones, is there? Yes. Ah. Didn't know uh, these ones are easier to move. Right, okay. Um, so you just delete them. That's all you do. Right. Well, you, you highlight, you don't have to, one. yeah, 
you don't have to you can just delete it from underneath oh okay right so, you have gone, yeah. um, so yeah so the source peddler is retaliated for two and then Orsh comes along so you don't have to attack with your hero obviously you would in this situation but your heroes yeah. do not have to attack if you don't want them to whereas your minions must attack if able to so Orsh deals it another one damage um, yep so I can just delete one of them then there we go so it's down to four Oh, sorry, yes, it's got Hunter. So the Hunter talent means it deals one extra damage against landmarks. So the Source Peddler should now be down to three. Is that three? I think that is three, isn't it? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Looks yeah, like if three, Battle three. One's done one and Orphan's done two, it should be down to two. Oh, of course, yes. There we go. Right, so it's down to two health. And that's it. That's the attack phase done. Um, you, you could have explored this one as well, but I possibly wouldn't have recommended it. Yeah, not while we've got the other two. Oh, no, anyway. actually, actually thinking about it, even if this one was really bad, the Battleborn could have chosen to attack the Source Peddler still. Uh, no, I can engage them. Oh, okay, so the engage overrides. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, right, back to Ian. So, again, decide whether you want to move your hero first or your minions. Um, I think we'll shift the minions. Oh, a uh, new rule about the Elfin Kazi, which wasn't in the original rule book, but they have changed this with the Errata, is the Elfin Kazi now, for the purpose of movement, is they they now move at the same time as the heroes. So, if, so yeah, your Elfin Kazi, although it is a minion, when it, when it actually moves and does its activation thing, it, it is before or after all of your minions. Okay, so did you say you were going to move your minions first? I think so, yeah. Okay, so that this front, so your minions must move uh, in order, starting with the leading one, which is the one which is closest to its mark. Uh, now, at this point, I think you actually have two leading minions. I think both of these two are the same distance from your mark, because I think this is the shortest, the shortest route. That's correct. Yeah. So you can choose which one of those you want to move first. Um, so, will the route be onto the centre tile? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, or it's got to use four movements. And it has to end closer than it started. So, you could go one, two, three, uh, four. Yeah, you could do that. Or you could go one, two, three, four. As long as you end closer than you started so and use all of your movement then you've got all sorts of options. Yeah, you can also move along like yeah. here as well. You can take the long way around. Now, that's, well, that's what I was looking at, is shifting this one to yeah. here. So that goes one, two, three, four. Shifting this one behind him. Ah, right, so well, hang on. Have a, have a crack at that. Okay, I'm crack just going to count the hexes. So it was here. Yeah, so that's one, two, three... Four, five, six, yes, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if it was here, that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think that's the same distance. Um, one, two, three, four, yeah, that would make sense because the um, no, because to there. One, yeah, it's got to be got to be closer. No, it's closer. I miscounted. Closer. Yeah, that's it, the, it that's, is closer. That's the, that's the common space, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I was about to. I was about to point that out. Is that you don't actually have to count all the way to the. No, nope, you just count to, to this one. Yeah. So yeah, you can move that to there. That's fine. I don't know where this is coming. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> have I just crashed that? Yeah. I'll leave. I'll leave some of these ex experts at stack in to do that. Okay. Yeah, we'll leave Mark to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Then I guess we'll move the other two up in a column behind. So the Humminger's movement is two. The quite badly wounded Humminger. Yeah, so at this point I'm beginning to wonder if I should have taken the, uh, the healer, but there you go. Choices. Yeah. Learning game. Um. Right. 
So he needs to come up somewhere, I think. Okay. And then Darv moves two, or up to two. And then the Elfin Kazi, if you want to, but you probably don't. Now, the Elfin Kazi's movement, you notice it doesn't actually have a movement stat. That's because it relies, I believe, on this roost ability. Is that right? That's how I understand it from the, uh, from the action sheet here. Uh, da, 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 da. Elfin Kazi, my unit with, yeah, with the number becoming their movement stat. So, yeah, if it takes off from here, it basically has two movements and it wants to go adjacent to something, defeat itself, and then uh, and then blow up. Right, okay, so uh, Andy Spire's attack, he doesn't have any exploration. Um, let's have a look at. Don't forget. These two, these three are going to have to attack this Traxia alone because it has engage. So even if they have another target, if there is something with engage, they have engage to attack that. Engage over right. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll take a chance. It's, uh, first game's a good game, I guess. Mm -hmm. So let's um, have a look at this one where my okay. thing is. Ooh. Yeah, that's a couple of things you're going to have to uh, look up on the sheet. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> this is it's one of those games where there's lots of keywords, and once you have played it a couple of times, uh, you will start to remember those keywords. And the, yeah, the reference sheets mean that everything is everything is summarised on there. So you just pick it up, have a bit of a read of it. So, um, without trying to give too much away, Ian, yeah. the re the re when it talks about the reward, that's printed on the right-hand side of the tile. And that, again, learning game, it, it, information uh, doesn't matter so much, I it, suppose. It, it's exactly a cool thing that, that might be useful. So, so, there are three types of rewards. There's source, which is the blue one, and that gives you increased source. There is a spire reward, which is a little tower on the side. And what that means is when you defeat that landmark or, yeah, when you defeat that landmark, you can construct a spire that you have access to on the spot that you defeated it for free, ignoring influence restrictions and not spending any source. And the last reward right. is a relic reward, which is the yellow one. Thanks. And that means that when you defeat it, you draw a card from the relic deck which if you've played other games like Magic the Gathering or it's it's like a a sorcery or like a a one shot ability you can gain or a continuous okay. effect that gives you abilities for the rest of the game. Some of the relics are really good and some of them you might draw and go, Oh, that's not very good at all. <laughs> it's a stick. Yeah. <laughs> well no, it, it, they're all good, but you might draw one that's just not really useful for the current situation that you're in. Okay, so that okay. Well, let, let's flip. Let, so I'm not going to gain anything immediate from that. I need no. to be able to defeat it. Okay. Uh, so leave that one out. Okay. So leave it face down. Yeah. Okay. And did you want to explore this one or not? <sighs> Pushing my lucky. We'll get another engage. That's going to be really painful, isn't it? Well, I think if you get another engage, I think you then have a choice of which one you attack. Oh, let's do it. So, yeah, I think you're safe. No, oh, that's interesting. Okay, do you want to look that up on the reference sheet to see what that does? Uh, no, I think I'm good with that. Okay. Right then, so that's your exploration done. So now we do attacks. Now, this Traxia Lone has three health left. Um, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Now I know what these two are, at which point can I flip them over when one of my pieces is next to them on another turn? Yeah, at the point. Uh, you, so you could have I, flipped this one over now if you wanted to, but you couldn't have flipped this one over now, I believe, because you've already passed that opportunity. Unless Mark's right. going to correct well, me. I think unit that's how it uh, each unit explores. So one of his units will explore this, and then 
one of his units would have explored this. He could reveal this and then have one of his other units explore oh, okay. this over here. So you could do that if you wanted and to. Then... Okay, let's do that then, because that might be amusing. <laughs> So that was, that was my acting skills, Andy. I was bluffing because he, he drew two tiles that are identical. <laughs> it was a ruse. <laughs> cunning. cunning right? Yes. So, yeah, the talents are, uh, they've both got Rift Walk, uh, which basically means that this, this landmark is treated as if it's a path hex. And if you move onto it, it immediately teleports you to another landmark that also has the talent Rift Walk. Uh, teleporting does not count as part of this unit's movement. Minions may use Rift Walk uh, as long as they make progress. Teleporting to an occupied Rift Walk landmark defeats any unit occupying it, so don't stay on one. Uh, and the other ability is Overload, which is basically on your turn. If you have a unit adjacent to this landmark, you may spend six source to gain its reward. And its reward for both of these is a random relic card, which you will draw from this deck of relic cards here. Okay, right, so attacks. Um, I probably want to get that retaliation on uh, this area. Yeah. Okay, so that attacks first. Uh, and takes the damage. Yep. Uh, and then the other Harry will attack. Yep, that takes the damage. And. The Humminger attacks. Humminger could just kill yeah. him off anyway. And that, and that gets rid of it. So you get four source. Put a little pile up here of things you've killed. Dive. That's the end of that one. Okay. Uh, there was something that I think I missed to tell you at the start of the turn. Yes, there was. So if we just rewind a little bit to the start of your turn, because you might have wanted to do this, I mentioned that at the start of your turn, you do get to do what's called a limited build action. And Andy didn't do it on his turn because he didn't have any source. But at the start right. of your turn, before you'd killed that uh, Traxia loner that you've just killed, which was worth how much? Yeah. Four? Um, four, yeah. Yeah, so you had five. You had five source at the start of your turn. So you could, yeah. if you'd have wanted to, you could have used one of your two limited build actions to build a spire here. Okay. And what that does, if we go back to when I mentioned influence, at the start of the game, you only have influence over this island here. As soon as you have a spire here, you now have influence over all of the islands adjacent to this island. Which means right. then next turn you'd be able to build a spire here. Right. Now whether you want to build a spire here okay. or not, I don't know, because Andy's units might actually come this way round. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, if you wanted to build a spire here at the start of your turn that we've just done, then I'll I'll let you do that. Well that definitely seems like a good thing to be doing, I think. Okay. Well let's have a look at the spires you have. Um now, Mark, remind me, are all four of the air spires available at the start of the game, or just two of them? No. Just two. Well, just I, have, I, yeah. think, I think I have to upgrade something to get... Okay, to, uh, so you have either Refuge, which has basically got one attack, one fortification, but no range. But remember, the default range is always one. So it's basically got one yeah. attack, one range, and extra hit point. Or you've got High Rise, which is one attack and effectively two range, but has got four blue dots on it. What that means is you can actually upgrade it beyond its initial, so it starts with two upgrades, it can have two more. Whereas Refuge starts with two upgrades and can only have two upgrades, so therefore you can't upgrade it beyond its, uh, its starting one. So everything starts, uh, every Spire starts with two upgrades? Uh, every Spire starts with the upgrades that's printed on it. Which for you is two, but is not always the case for other ones. I, I, I see. So, so, those with three. so the refuge will gain those two tokens. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yep. And those are the two blue dots, effectively the two blue dots. They are the two blue dots, yeah. Right. So let's go with the high rise then. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to take a peg from the bag. 
and we need to pop it into the bottom of your thing here to show that you have used one of your limited build options for this wave. So it's a start of turn thing. You can use both limited build actions in the same turn uh, if you wanted to, but you only get two of them for the whole wave. Okay, then you spend the source, however much source you want to, whichever one you want to buy. It was uh, four, I think, for the four high, for high rise. rise. Okay. Um, and then Mark has actually created this mod, so we actually have proper spires. So these don't come with the default mod, but yeah, Mark's put these in there. Awesome. Yeah, okay. I didn't create the mod, but yeah. Oh, you didn't? I thought you did. I just, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I modified the mod. It's, you modified uh, yeah. the mod, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so High Rise has one attack and one range. Uh, so there's the one range, there's the one attack. And you can actually put these in any order you want to, but I would recommend putting them in that order. Uh, and then we put the high rise on the top. The reason for the order is that whenever this spire takes damage, the chip comes off the bottom. So if you put right. the attack on the bottom, as soon as it's taken any damage, sure, it's got two it's range, not. but it can't actually attack. So uh, yeah, I, I would generally put attack first and then the range on the bottom. So remember the bit that I found quite confusing when I first played it? The range of this spire is two, because it's one by default, and then plus one for every range chip on it. So if Andy's units get within range two of that, it's going to attack them for one. Or one die. It's not actually a fixed amount of damage. Uh, and it's not a d6. It's, uh, it's like a dice with a zero and a two and four ones on it. Okay, so that was one of your limited build actions. Uh, then we then we did your turn, and now it is Andy's go. Turn, um, so, right. So, um, if I let the Battle of Bull and wander off to the middle, Orsh is still going to do his extra damage on the yes. peddler and kill it. And kill it. So yeah. So that's that's, that's fine. Over here. So battle ball move two. And this one can go over here. Two. Okay. He inspires attack you. He hasn't got any in range. You can explore if you want to. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, so if you want to look that up on the reference sheet, see what it does, and then decide whether you want to reveal it or not. Uh, where's the reference sheet for that one? Uh, top left, I believe. Yeah, up there. Just popped in the chat. Jonathan's just popped in the chat. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for joining in. No, I don't think there's much benefit in that one at the moment. Okay, so that's going to stay face down. Uh, and then we go to attacks. So, yeah, I think very simply, Orsh, with his one attack, but with his hunter talent, does two damage to the source peddler, uh, and you get six source. Yeah. And that is gone. There we go. Let's put a list over here of things that you've killed. So yeah, six source, nice. Right, Ian, your turn. So you still have one limited build action available, which you could have actually used at the start of last turn. And if you really wanted to, you could upgrade this spire by spending source, or you could build another spire here, or you could save it. It's up to you. Um. So you haven't actually explained how much cost it is for... Yeah. Nope, I haven't upgrade explained experience. upgrading. So the cost to upgrade is uh, one source for each chip that is on the spire after you've added the chip. So in other words, if you wanted to add a chip to high rise now, it would cost you three source. If you were to add an attack chip or a range chip, if you were then to uh, add another one, the fourth one would cost you four source with the exception of the fortification chips. The fortification chips always cost two. Uh, yeah. Um. And you can put as many upgrades as you want as one build option. With, with one action, yeah. So if, for example, Ian, now you had seven source, you could use one limited build action, spend seven source, add a third chip and a fourth chip, 
and then the high rise would be fully upgraded with one build action. You're not in any rush. He's, he's not going to get you. You've got another opportunity if he manages to get through. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it for now because I'm not sure how much power I need to put into that. Yeah. Thing. Okay, so we go to your <coughs> movement. Are you going to move Darb first or are you going to move your minions first? Sorry, are you going to move Darb and the Elfin Kazi or your minions first? Yeah. Well, you can do Darb, then minions, then Elfin Kazi. Then Elfin Kazi, yeah. As long yeah. as it's a four rep. Yeah. Yeah. Um. He's having a quick look at Andy's stack here. He's got quite a lot of minions. Uh, right, so there's only two there. Yeah, so I've got a dispatch hiding in there. Okay, that could be painful. So. Okay, let's let's try this. Okay. I'm gonna can I move my foot this top area mm -hmm. to here? Yep, because it's moved four and it's ended closer to its mark than it started. So that's a legal movement. Okay. Okay, now you must move this one next. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think his movement is gonna take him because I can't double up. I think his movement's actually going to take him all the way to here. Uh, you could go here if you really wanted to. Or you could, could go... go through. Or you could go there. Um, uh, uh, let's just pile him in. <laughs> I have no idea whether this yep. is clever or not. Yeah, there's a learning game. Right, so now the Humminger must move, right. which has got a two movement. Right, so now I can use this... Uh, so I didn't really want the Harrier to go that far, but I can't. And you're going to have a read of Glide Bomb, which I'm sure you've already read. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, did, yeah, did you want to send the Harrier there or did you want to send it here where it's safe from the glide bomb? Assuming you're going to go in with the glide bomb on this side. Yeah. That was the plan. But then he could, I could sacrifice him for a point. Which might be a bit miserable. Because uh, the, glide, the glide bomb is going to happen at the end of movement before your units attack. So it's not counted as an attack, it's actually part of the movement part step. In which case I probably definitely want him over the other side. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so now the humming moves, and that moves two. He goes he goes to the gate port. So one oh, right. the gate, and then <laughs> one out the other side, is that correct? Nice. Rift walk. Treat it at a path. Moving on to it, teleports. Yeah, I think so. So you can move it one, immediately teleports to there two. Okay. Um, and I probably, uh, let's just have Darb move straight up. Middle there. Darb flies up, and then you've got the Elfin Kazi that's gonna leave its roost. And I think I want to drop the bomb there. <laughs> nice. Okay, so we activate the glide bomb, which defeats this unit and deals two damage. So that has to go back. Uh, and yeah, it's two damage. 
to all adjacent units, fortress gates, and spires. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'm getting two for that Battleborn. You get two swords for defeating. You were responsible for defeating that Battleborn, which goes back to Andy's barracks. Uh, so, it can come back again. You get two swords for that. There you go. Yeah, so that's one of the advantages. Of... Say again, Mark. Uh, there was one of the advantages of grouping. The, yeah. Uh, the the Battleborn only had one health, so when it dealt, got dealt two damage, it did not carry over to the dispatch. The dispatch yeah. has full health. Yeah. Sure. Okay. No, I think that's why I wanted to get the the um, Harrier in. Yeah. And do the damage first get him out of the way but then i've got no space for the uh, glide bomb so yeah yeah and the glide bomb is is. Is. glide bomb happens at the end of movement so we're now into exploration if you wanted to explore this tile in the middle yeah that's how i look see although and he's already looked at it so you know it's not engage right oh I think, to be honest, now that you've both seen it, it's probably as well just to turn it over. You might as well just flip it over. Just have a quick look at what the. Uh... You both happy if I flip it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. flip it now. Yeah. Yep, yeah. oh, I've given it too much health. <laughs> There you go. So what's the deal with the secret passage? Then? So, secret passage. Um, you may basically, you can attack this tile to remove its health chip. Once the health chip has been removed, which thematically represents, I think, that you've you know cleared a load of rubble or something like that, uh, you can then move on to this landmark to locate an unrevealed landmark on an adjacent tile and swap it, which doesn't count as part of the hero's movement. So it's only heroes that can use the secret passage. And then when your hero moves off this landmark, you put a health chip on it. So you basically, want, you, you attack it first, get rid of the health chip, and then a hero can move onto it and come out somewhere else. Right. It's a really complicated game for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, what's next? It is attacks. So who do you want to attack and in what order? Well, I guess the Harrier's just going to have a crack at the Dispatch yeah. anyway. So the Harrier attacks the Dispatch, deals one damage to the Dispatch. Um, yep, there you go. Um, and then the Harrier dies from the retaliation. Yeah. Okay. So Andy gets two swords as a reward. Now, although the dispatch has two range, that only applies to its attacks. I don't believe it applies to retaliations. I think retaliations have to be... Or have I got that wrong? No. Well, it can retaliate from two axes away. But it can. Only, uh, okay, so it affects its attacks and it, also its retaliations. Okay. As I was saying it, I yeah. thought, no, this is wrong. Um, so this Harrier, you, you have a choice, I think. I don't think you have to attack with this Harrier. You do. Oh, you do? Okay. So that's the secret passage. Yeah, it's then, a target. Okay. Uh, and then Darb doesn't have anything to attack. So, okay. That's the end of your attacks. Uh, and that is the end of your turn. So, Andy, your turn. Limited build action if you want it. Uh, no, I won't bother. Okay, you're going to keep your source. Yeah. Right, movement. Okay. Um, Dispatch has two movement, but it does have two range. Yeah. Uh, can I send him that way? Is that valid? Just to have interest. I think that's he's... the same it's distance. Further... distance. I can't move him back now. There we go. You, you could make what's called a lateral move if it was the only move that you could make. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, well, in that case, I don't think I've got any choice on where he goes. He's going to have to go here. Yeah, if a, if a minion cannot use its full movement while making progress, it will make progress using as much as its movement as, as possible. So if, if this path wasn't here, you do. it could move to there and then... We stop. do actually have another choice in moving yeah. here, here, if you wanted to end on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, since we've got range, let's do that. And let's now, set... Orsh, just just to let you know, if a minion yeah. dies, it goes back to your barracks. Yeah. If Orsh dies, he doesn't go back to your barracks. Mm -hmm. Now, the way okay. that you can heal your heroes, there's a few ways, uh, but one of the ways is you can actually go back. So if you if you move all the way back and you end up on your own fortress gate, Orsh will be removed, put next to your barracks, and then will turn back up at the start of the next wave, back to full health. Okay. And, and what I if feel just really, really bad. Gone? Say again, Mark. I missed this. I, I missed this. Uh, I, I need to commit Sudoku now. Um, Osh gets an upgrade. Oh, because Osh killed the Source Peddler. From... Yes. Yeah, we're missing an upgrade. Thank you. So let's quickly do that. What would you like? Uh, uh, what upgrades can I choose from? Uh, attack or Fortification. Um, and what's fortification do it's an extra hit point uh, let's let's have extra attack okay there you go right okay so what happens if he dies then is that him gone yeah he's gone well he probably ought to run away then because he's almost dead as it is um, yeah, let's run away. Tactical retreat, I think, is the, is the term. <laughs> Advance in the opposite direction. Yeah. That <laughs> right, is that all your movement okay. done? Yeah, I think so. so. Ian Spires would attack you. There's none of them. Exploration, there's none of that. So now it's your attack. You have a one attack at two range. So, yeah, so you uh, are allowed to target Darb. Which you wouldn't have been able to do if you didn't have range. Yeah, not much point there because I won't be able to kill him. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see next turn that how we could. Okay, let's let's kill this thing. Yeah. Okay. So you get two source for killing the hunger. Yep. Let's pop that back in. There we go. Okay. Um, Ian's go. Limited build action if you want it, and then after you've done that, movement. Um, oh, I've got seven more. The dispatch got two health on him. Yeah. So is my, I don't know, to throw another spider up. There's my spiders. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick another high rise. Okay. On Let's this get one. Another... Where's his spines gone? Aha, there it is. And there we go. Okay, so that costs you four source, and that is your second limited build action so no more limited build actions yeah. for you for this particular wave and then it's your movement so i'm assuming the harrier has to go and chase Orsh. well he has to move four 
and he has to make progress. So your options are one, two, three, four. That is one option. Or one, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four. He's also legal. So as long as you end up closer than when you started and use all of your movements, you've still got flexibility within that. So yeah, do you want to end up next to Orsh, where you will attack Orsh, deal him one damage, and then he'll kill you? Or do you want to end up there, where there'll be no attacking? Or do you want to end up there, where you'll be able to attack the dispatch? And, uh, yeah, he ran... You can also go super fancy He's... and, and no, uh, move through Darb. Oh yeah, you could, couldn't you? <laughs> you go one, two... Then where would he go, though? So... Oh, you could go with one, two, three, four. Is that closer? It's not closer. But if I go and attack Orsh, oh, she's not going to get to retaliate. He's only got one hit point. Though. No, he's got a fortification chip. Oh, no, oh, sorry, right. he doesn't. He took a... He ah, yeah, so Andy's made a tactical mistake there. Oh, doesn't that count? Nope. Ah, shit. I didn't realise that. Okay, would you have taken a fortification? I would upgrade? have given him the fortification, okay, or I would yeah. have attacked the hawk okay. thingy instead. But I'll, I'll, I'll... The fact that you said the S word means that you clearly didn't <laughs> didn't mean that. So, okay, there you go. No, the attack chips is literally plus one attack. They they do not count as a hit point. Whereas fortification chips only count as a hit point and don't don't do anything else. So. Okay. Okay then. So in which case I want to go and I want to trade off the dispatch. I probably do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you go uh, one, that two. We'll see. Both three. Will that not kill the end of the round? Um. Cause that, so the end of the end. the end of the wave is when all minions have gone. So what's going to happen two, is heroes. Yeah, so your Harrier will attack the Dispatch. The Harrier will then die. Darb will then attack the Dispatch. The Dispatch will then die, and the wave ends. Now, if you're happy with the wave ending at that point, then do it. Because all she's on his way running back home to heal up, and he won't get home. Um, but you might not want the wave to end, which means you'd have to kill, keep the Dispatch alive. So, yeah. Choices. Choices indeed. So, if I move Darb onto the secret passage instead of killing a dispatch. Yeah. Dispatch has got two two health. It's got two health left. Yeah. See where this game gets uh, quite exciting then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think they've changed the dictionary um, and replaced the word tactical, or the definition of the word tactical is, is just cloud spire. I think that's what they've done. <laughs> so if Darb goes into the secret passage. Yep. Then you choose an unrevealed landmark on an adjacent island and basically swap them. Okay, well that could be interesting. It could, <laughs> it definitely could. Could pop a ball. So let's. I think I think you said my. That's fine. How yep. you can go? Because you can go see. one. So from there you can go one, two, three, four. And let's put Darb onto the. Onto the secret passage. passage. Okay. So where do you want to come out? I think over there. Okay, so what we do is we swap that with that. And then when Darb leaves that spot, we put a health chip, health chip under the secret passage. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, but that doesn't count as your movement, so you've still got two movement left. Yeah, uh, right. Oh, sorry, one movement left. Yeah, because it was one to move on there, wasn't it? So yeah, you got one movement left. 
and he's flying. He so how does the defense chip work? Um, it's just one extra hit point. Right. Yeah. So, so it's got... it, it, it doesn't. It's not like armor that lasts. Per nope. Time. Nope. It's just for for heroes. It's one extra hit point. For spires, it's slightly different. He's gonna die. Well, if if Ian decides to put the Harrier here and 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 Darb there, then yes, or she's right. dead. Even if he doesn't, I can't get home next round, or so he's going to finish me off the turn. Oh, after. I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you've taken yeah, the secret I passage think, with him. I think yes. I'm going to do that then. Right. That's okay. Okay. I'm trying to pick up these chips with the fortification chip on the bottom. <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Ah, that's the way you do it. Okay, right. Um, so, who do you want to do the attack first? Um, I think I need Darb to do it, because otherwise the um, Harry is going to die. Yeah, but remember, if Darb does the finishing blow... You'll get an upgrade. Oh, yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. So, what would my the upgrade would be flipping him out? Uh, yeah. Also, also, remember that that Osh does a finishing blow. He gets an upgrade. Oh right. So if he if Ian attacks with the Harrier. Does one damage to Orsh, Orsh retaliates, kills the Harrier, Orsh immediately gets an upgrade and would level up. Okay. Oh, no, he would lose right. the fortification so he can get another fortification. Yeah. But what's his health on the other side? Let's just have a look at the other side of Orsh. It's the same health. Uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't change his, he wouldn't upgrade. So what would happen is the Harry would attack, mm -hmm. the fortification would go away, and then Osh would retaliate. And then, because Osh doesn't have any upgrades, he can gain an upgrade chip. Oh which right. Will be fortification. Oh, okay. So if you want to kill Osh this turn, you'd need to attack with Darb first. Yeah, let's do that then. Okay. So Darb attacks. The fortification chip comes off. Uh, retaliate back. Fortification chip comes off Darb. Um, and then the Harrier attacks, and Osh dies. And Ian, you get a three source. Mm -hmm. Put Osh over here on the dead pile. Alrighty, okay. So I think that is the end of Ian's turn. Um, Andy, limited build action if you want it. Uh, no, I'm just going to let this round play out and see what happens. Are you sure? Yeah. Don't want to build a defensive spire? Do I have any innate defences in the base? Uh, no. Uh, well, yeah, every time the fortress gate is attacked, it will deal one damage back, but only one. Well, that's fine. I'm not going to get game over this round, so I'll just leave it. Okay. Right then, so it's your turn. Uh, you move the dispatch to... Yep, uh, let's go over here. Okay, so now we have our first spire attacking. So after you've moved... Uh, the enemy spires attack. So remember, this high rise has got a range of two because uh, it's one default plus one for the range chip and it has one attack. So that means we actually now have our first attack dice. So, Ian, I'd like you to roll this attack dice to see how much damage you deal to the dispatch. Okay, it's one damage. I will get used to this interface, I promise. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Brian, then... you should probably Brian, you should probably copy this chip instead of the ones you're using, just because that way it's consistent. So that because Paul's trying to use the other ones. I am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now it's your attack, Andy. Okay. I shoot the tower. Yeah. Okay. So the way that attacking towers works is, no matter how much damage you do, whether it be one or a billion you remove the bottom chip. The only exception is, if the bottom chip is a fortification chip, the damage that you deal must be at least two. 
So in this case, it's one damage, so simply the ranged chip comes off. But yeah, even if you had two damage or five damage or whatever, it would still be okay. just the bottom range chip comes off. And there we go. I think that's it. So, Ian, your turn. Uh, right, so do... So I could potentially rebuild... No, because you've power. used both of your limited build I've options used for this way. Limited, yeah. yeah, okay. Otherwise, yes, you could have done. Interesting. Okay. Right then. So, again, I don't have much of a choice with the Harrier. He's just going to go charging towards the gate. Is that correct? Yep, yep. Harrier goes, yeah, one, two, three, and then stops. So, if I move... Ooh, just killed Darb. Um, if I move Darb to here... Mm -hmm. Would that then stop the Harrier getting through? And can I still attack the gate from Yeah, so if you move Darb first to here, then what would happen is, remember, your own heroes can't block your own minions, so the Harrier would come along and displace Darb, and Darb would end up here. So I, I would probably suggest moving your Harrier first to here, and then Darb flies to here, because he's flying, he can cover, he can land on any terrain type. Yeah, I, well, that was, that, that was the two things. I was just trying to extend Harrier yeah. life. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, area lives matter. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, yeah. sp spires attack, but Andy didn't didn't build any exploration. There isn't any of that. So it is now your attack. So to attack the fortress gate, basically you have to attack this hex here, um, and the fortress gate always retaliates. Infinite range, infinite amount of times but always only ever one damage back. So basically your Harrier attacks it for one. So Andy, you need to knock your health down by one and then the Harrier dies, so you do get two source as well. Uh, and then Darb attacks for another one. Um, and yeah, one of them goes as well. So that Harrier goes back to the barracks. Uh, so the net result of that is that Andy's base is on eight health but he did gain two source for doing it. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for Ian's turn. So, Andy, your turn. Okay. Uh, where do we go this time? Let's just charge free another I, I two will... and die horribly. Yeah, I will point out that, Andy, you got the source drill advancement. So next wave, you are going to gain ten source. Yep. If you want to use a limited build option. So oh yes, it's the limit of 20, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, okay. Because um, you're going to get um, you're going to get seven source next time, plus your bonus three. Yeah. Uh, right. In that case, I kind of need to build something. You do. So we'll use one of your limited build actions. What would you like to build? Uh, what can I choose from? Just the uh, spires. Yeah, you can basically either build a spire or build a spire. But except you can't build the drilling outpost because it has the mining ability and yeah. the mining ability says cannot be built in the conquest uh, yeah where is it mining so uh, cannot be built in... be this. yeah so your choices are being very limited <laughs> so we'll take one of your spires where are you going to build it uh, let's go over this side okay remember you can build it here if you wanted to uh, yeah that looks more fun let's do that okay. so this comes with uh, one attack and one range, and it can be upgraded further. It can have an extra one thing on it. And it also has the ability Splash. So that cost me three, was it? Uh, four. <laughs> four, yeah. yeah. It cost you four. Okay. Now, if you wanted to, you may choose to use your second limited build option at this time to put an upgrade on it? No, I don't think I will. Okay. Uh, right, so then it's your turn. Your dispatch has moved. Yep. And now the enemy spires attack. So this one is now out of range, so this can't attack you, because it's only got a range of one. But this, this one is in range, so again, Ian, you roll one dice. 
And if you get a one or a two... Is that a range of one? Don't they normally have an extra one? No, default range is one. Yep. Plus one for every green chip. Ah, the green. Okay. Yeah, the green chip is the yeah, range you, and you, you got rid of that. You took my green chip away. Yeah. yeah. So I think he enrolled a two. So the dispatch is dead. And... Ah, well, hang on a sec. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so Ian gets three source. And at that point, there are no minions on the board. Yay. So the wave ends immediately. Right. There you go. That is wave one. <laughs> We've been at it a while, but this is a learning game. And yeah, you need to be prepared for learning games obviously taking longer uh, especially a game of, of this complexity but yeah that is the end of wave one so now we go to wave two now something is going to happen at the start of wave two that didn't happen at the start of wave one which is the event phase uh, and i have to say that there are some people who play this game without the event phase because the event phase is, it, yeah what's going to happen could be quite a major effect on the game uh, and some people don't like that some people like it just you know pure as it is um, but the first player passes, so Ian is now the start player, but we are now going to get an event. We're going to play with them, and let's see what we've got. We have Momentary Prosperity. In turn order, players may add one upgrade to each of their spires at no cost. Any player with one or fewer spires in play may instead build a spire at no cost if possible. Okay, so that's a good one for both of you. So in turn order, starting with Ian. Uh, um, I'll I'll put the rain. Um, now I'll remember, it's going to be more expensive to add one to this than it would be to this. If that mattered. Ah, right. Okay. So what determines the cost is the, the previous upgrade. Uh, it's the number of previous upgrades plus one. So to add a third chip costs three, and to add a fourth chip costs four unless you're adding a fortification fortification upgrades are always two source so does he get to upgrade both of his spires there it says one upgrade to each of their spires uh yeah. to one upgrade the one upgrade oh yeah sorry yeah one upgrade to each of their spires at no cost oh, awesome. whereas andy instead of doing that you may actually build a new spire at no cost um no he's got a spire hasn't he or is yeah, already... it's if you've got one or fewer. Yeah. So he's got one spire, so you can build oh, a new right. one. Okie dokes. Yeah, right, so I'll put, my range, I'll put the range back on this one. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and what do you want to put on the other one? Range or an attack? Or possibly um, fortification? Again. Um, I'll put an attack on, please. Okay. There we go. Okay. Are you building another dispatch platform, Andy? Mm, that's a good question. Could I put the dispatch platform thing down now and use that as the location for the spire? Uh, what's the question again? Uh, I've got this this little tile here. Could I put that down before no, no. building the spire? No. So I, I I just saw this. Um, the attack was have to go on the bottom. For which one? For the Cyrus. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, because you upgraded it, didn't you? And I put it on the top. Yeah, that's right. So every upgrade that you add must go on the bottom of any existing upgrade. Thank you, Mark. There you go. That's a nasty looking tower. It is, yeah. Okay, you happy with that, Andy? Yeah, that'll do. Right, so that's the event 
dealt with. That was a fairly uh, fairly painless one. There are ones in there that are very very <laughs> have a fairly major effect on the game. Should we say? Right. Okay. Discard resolve cards and remove limited build your option pegs. Done that. Draw and read the event card. Done that. Income phase. So we're on wave two. So you both get seven source. And I'm now going to clear the market. I'm getting three extra. Right, I'm going to clear the market of chips. I'm going to draw three new ones. Okay, we've got crazy promo tile in there. I'll, I'll just move that one to one side for now. We'll play without the crazy promo tile. Only because it has a talent which isn't actually explained on the reference sheets that we've got with us. Uh, right, so we're, in, we're now in the market phase. So we've done the income phase, uh, market phase, and it's Ian first to buy something from the market. Let's have a look at what we've got. So we have a hero. Now, remember what I said about an hour and a half ago. Uh, you can only ever have two heroes at most in the game at any one time. So Ian, you have Darb, who's in play. If you were to buy Lostermeyer, uh, that would be your second hero. You wouldn't be able to recruit one of your other heroes from your barracks if you took that one. Uh, we also have the Anarchist, which is a crazy powerful unit that only cost one source. So surely that's completely broken, except it has the Anarchy talent, which basically means uh, before this unit's movement, every turn, you roll a d6, and on a 5 or 6, he gets bored and wanders off and disappears. Now, a little bit of tactical advice. If you group him underneath another unit, the Anarchy talent does not apply. So you can actually keep him at the bottom of a stack of a grouped unit, uh, and then only reveal him sort of near the end. Uh, and this last one, this is a Mercenary Spire. So Mercenary Spires, basically you build them as if they were your Spires. Uh, this one has one attack, three range, and it has an ability that I've never seen before. Look out. At the start of your turn, you may look at a landmark tile within four hexes of this Spire. This is not considered exploring. Okay, cool. Uh, or you could buy the Earthscape. Remember, the Earthscape costs two source. So, Ian, would you like to buy something from the market? Wow, 16 source. 18 source. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Both got a lot of source. This is going to be a big round. So, what does Lost Maya do? Uh, what's he got? Assist. Right, okay, let's have a look at what assist does. Um, this unit may gain an upgrade chip, subject to normal conditions, when an adjacent friendly unit defeats an opposing unit or spire. So he doesn't have any attack himself, but he can get three upgrades over the course of the game. Okay, that sounds like that's going to be complicated. Mm, yeah, it is a bit. That Bible Tower, is there... That would be anywhere worth having. So what would happen is that you would take this chip and you'd put it next to your barracks. It doesn't... So buying the chip is not constructing the spire. You just buy the chip, no. put it in front of you, no. and you, you can construct it as if it was one of your spires. And a later time, too. Okay. It's got one attack at three range. Can it cost me six? And potentially I could construct that on my walls. Yep, yeah, your two uh, two spaces in your fortress are spaces where you can construct one. I found, again, I haven't played this game that much, but I found that uh, sometimes I've constructed a spire on my fortress gate and it's actually been a complete waste of time because my opponent never actually got near me. And then there's been other times where I didn't build one there and really wished I had. Yeah. Now, you've already got a couple of high-rises here, but as the waves go on and he's going to be buying more and more units, these aren't going to be enough. But, conversely, you're buying no, your own units no. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okie dokes. Let's... That Bible's quite good with its range, I think. So let's have that. Uh, 
Five okay. Four, so you buy that. That costs you six source. And we're going to put that next to your barracks so that you can build it at some point. And every time you buy a market chip, uh, we actually replace it with a new one. So there we go. And another... Ah, now this is another thing we've not seen yet. This is a piece of equipment. Uh, sorry, Paul. I, yeah. Can I just play that, build that Bible Spire now, I've paid for it? As a build action, or yes. Do, or, is, or is there additional cost? Uh, nope, no additional cost. You've paid for it, so you can just build it. Right, okay. Okay, so the new thing in the market that's come out, this is a piece of equipment. Equipment you actually attach to one of your heroes, and that, that hero has then got that piece of equipment for as long as they're alive. The mini harvester, I've actually seen that a couple of times before. It has the ability of, it has the talent reap, which means once per wave, uh, if you are adjacent to a source well, even if it's a covered over source well, you roll a d6 and get that much source. Right, Andy, would you like to buy something from the market? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have the Anarchist. It looks okay. far too much fun not to take yeah. it. So, okay, so that costs you one source. You take the Anarchist, so technically speaking, we are supposed to replace it, but they're all going to disappear anyway. Yeah. Anyone else is playing up. Right, so you've both done that. We now go to the build phase. Uh, Ian, you get to do a build action first. Okay. Let's have a look. You've got ten source left. This is going to be very much an experimental round for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you're starting the wave with Darb right next to your fortress gate with Ian going first. I assume he's going to run away. Yeah, it's how far can he run is the thing, mm. isn't it? Cause... But remember, he is flying, so these two spires here, they can't actually attack. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, because they don't have air defence. So Darby's is actually safe right now from these two spires. Uh, so does the, the, the range not count for the spires? Uh, no. No, the range of a spire is, is handled in a different way for range of, of units. Yeah. So what Andy would have to okay. do is he would have to do some research. He'd have to buy, I believe it is the uh, the smelter upgrade, which allows him to then build the lance launcher, which has air defense, if he wanted to get Darb out. Or just build a couple of dispatches and come after you, because Darb is quite wounded. Yeah, uh, the, the, I wasn't expecting him to survive, to be honest, but there you go. Um, right, got to go back to uh, build. Yep, building. What would you like to build? I'm just looking at my advances. Yeah, you got so much choices. I'll just uh, I'll just pop to the chat. So you see, Matt's here. Hi, Matt. So we've got Matt here. We've got Jonathan here. We've got twenty people watching apparently. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for watching. Just looking at the time, it is four thirty. Uh, I'd allocated a four-hour slot for this because I've got lots of other things going on. So what I'm tempted to do, uh, unless something crazy happens and the game ends in wave two, is probably just play the first couple of waves today uh, and then I'll save it. And then if Andy and Ian are happy, we can we can come back at some point uh, later on and play uh, play the rest of the game. But um, yeah, that, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll just play today and we'll, we'll see how far we go. As I said, the first wave was very slow because we were teaching, but from this point on, it, it will speed up. So, right, we've got, we've got 10 points to play with. So let's... Yeah. And you've got all sorts of choices. Oh, I've got some crazy choices. Mm -hmm. So, I take it these on either side of these. Yeah, the one game that I've played for this with Mark, Mark was playing the airs, and I was like, oh, okay, so, so that's how you play them then. <laughs> the, the stuff that he was doing, uh, yeah, was, was quite crazy. 
But that's the difference between knowing yeah. the rules of the game and actually knowing properly how to play the game. Um, okay. But well, yeah, you end up basically. I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little bit that I know. You end up with having spires which have the ability to have your elfin Kazi on. So your elfin Kazis can basically hop between the different spires and roost on them and then take off from there. And it, yeah, it just goes crazy. Whereas the Brawnen are just, um, yeah, big tough units that charge forward and hit things. But there, there's some clever stuff that you can do with them. They charge quite well, slowly. The first level of the airstrip then, please, Paul. First level of the airstrip, okay. So I'll pop your peg in, peg in there. Uh, where are the pegs? Pegs. Uh, oh no, there it is. Where did that peg go? I just copied a peg over and lost it. Uh, so airstrip. Airstrip, there. Pop, in, okay. So that's your first build action. Over to Andy, your build action. Uh, level one assembly for five. Level one assembly for five. Okay, so what does that do? Uh, it means that your Aegis minions deploy on their promoted side. Okay, so you know, I mentioned that some of the units have uh, flipped sides. So we, we might as well just flip the whole lot over because all of your Aegis minions now deploy on their promoted side. Okay. Um, Back to you, Ian. Seven swords left. I will do my level two airstrip, please. Okay. Remove three points. Yep, level two airstrip is in. Let's just have a look at what that does. Uh, airstrip. So, when deploying from the fortress, units with the talent flying may spend their movement to fly to a hex. Jason to an air spike. Yeah. And when deploying from the fortress, units may use the talent flying may spend their movement to fly to a hex. Jason to Right, okay, right, okay, nice. <laughs> uh, back to you, Andy. Um, I'll build an Aegis, surprisingly. Uh, we're, that's that's in oh, the next yeah. phase. We're, Nothing then. No. No more builds? Nope. Okay. Uh, Ian, anything else you want to build? Um... Part of me saying yes, and part of me saying save, save you points. Um, well, I can put that Bible Tower up on my walls, can't I? Free. Uh, so let's do can. that while I'm thinking about what else to yeah, spend. If you want on. to, you can. So let's uh, somebody wants to do the plastic thing on this yep. side. Put it over there. Okay, and it comes with an attack and three range. Now, technically, what I'm doing is is wrong, but I'm doing it anyway. So technically speaking, the attack and the range upgrades are limited. To what you get in the box and you're not allowed to put one on if you can't but just for the ease of this i'm, I'm just copying and pasting okay it's very unlikely you'll get rid of all of them anyway yeah in a two-player game i've seen it once happen in a 2v2 game and it was odd somebody wanted to like oh i want to up upgrade this and was like sorry we're out of chips so Okay, so that was your yeah. that was your build action, even though that that didn't cost anything. Andy's passed, so. Um, I oh, do I add health or do I <laughs> go for advanced minarets and spires? Just want a quick look at what they're about. Is there any significance to the star apart from saying it's been upgraded? No, that's what the star means. Uh, okay, let's do the Academy Peak then. So Academy Another Peak level one. Higher level spires. Okay. So Academy Peak level one. Yeah, you are now allowed to build the other ones. So the spires are the spire chips are two sided, um, yep. and yeah, you can now build any four of the spires that you want to. 
Okay, and that cost, that was your four. remaining source, wasn't it? That was my remaining four, yeah. yeah. So if you are done, that is the end of the build phase. So we now go into the prep phase. So again, you both declare your marks, which is the other player. And in wave two, you now have seven command points to spend on buying units. And Ian, you roll your sanctuary die to see if you get more than seven. Nope. So seven for you and seven for Andy. Outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> dice, eh? Now, Andy sounds like he's got a cunning plan. Yeah, that's what bothers me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm just just letting things happen. It's yeah. a learning game. It's a learning game, yeah. I'm just going to read what your AG is doing. Yeah, I mean, I've played... Um, so, I mean, there's a solo mode for this game, and the first solo scenario is the Brawnen versus the Heirs, and I think I've played that maybe four times as the Brawnen, and gradually I started to learn how the Brawnen actually played. Because um, at the start of the game, when I first played it, I just looked at this list and went, oh, I don't understand any of this. Um, and then talking to people on the various uh, groups, they were like, oh yeah, you need to do that and do this, and if you take that and then move this here, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> so yeah, learned quite a lot. Uh, just remember, Andy, if you were to group, if you were to buy an Aegis, you would not be able to group an Anarchist underneath the Aegis. Uh, why is that? Because the Anarchist moves two, and the Aegis only moves one. I thought it's the other way around. You can't. Sorry, it's the other way around. Yes. 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 You know, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Which you will. Nope. No. Wrong way around. What else do I want to buy? Ian, could you just do me a favour for a second? Yeah. Can you just mute your microphone? Yeah. Can you still hear me? Can still hear you. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Let's see. If I might be picking up on a uh, camera mic. Let's disconnect that. Only because it sounds like there's a very loud computer fan, and I was just trying to work out whose it was. Could be mine. Because I got a fairly new, uh, well, I got a new laptop recently, last month. Um, and whatever I do on the laptop, the fan is so loud. So I thought, okay, well, I'm never going to be able to do this for any online streaming. <laughs> right, I've, I've removed my camera. So okay. I hope that, that mic's disconnected if you can hear me now. I can hear you, yeah. Okay, yeah, if, I count, if I count to five and then mute halfway through. Okay. One, two. Did you hear all of one to five or did it cut I didn't, off? I didn't hear one to five. I, you muted halfway through, but the fan was still loud. So it could be Andy's. Okay. It could be Andy's fan. But yeah, stick with the new microphone in because that sounds, that sounds clearer. Yeah, well, that's the one that's close. I didn't realise that the camera mic was picking off because it's shown right. as the uh, Sony switched off. But there you go, electronics. Yeah. That was it. I mean, I, I was trying to play a game over Discord a couple of nights ago and I've got four cameras connected to the computer and it wouldn't see any of them. So I had to attach a fifth camera to another USB port. And it's like my, my poor computer, it's got all these cameras connected to it. It gets confused. Right, I need to select some bloody units, don't I? That's, um... uh, Jonathan's saying this is why he built his PC with super quiet fans. Yes, so my desktop unit, which is down here, is a very powerful desktop unit and that has quiet fans on it. Um, but yeah, my laptop, yeah, as I say, the new laptop, really good laptop, really like the laptop, super fast. But uh, yeah, boy, is it is it loud. <laughs> um... I really have no idea what I'm going to do with these. Yeah, the airs are a tricky one to play. Well, I've got yeah. bonuses for flying units. I don't have many flying units. No, you've got the Royal okay. Talon. Now, you promised not to use it in round one, but we're now in round two. Or wave two. Yeah, that's 
pretty much all the points, isn't it? That's the silly yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. And then a couple does, of Harriers. Does do some serious damage, mind. It does, yeah. Sorry if you can hear me, and that's my phone on again. That's all right. Just all of your heroes are also flying, so there's that. Who are we sorry? Oh, the heroes, all yeah. Of... Yeah. I think it's possibly a mistake, but I'm going to take the, the Royal Talon, I think. Yeah, the five. And then a couple of Harriers. Yeah. Yeah, seems fine. There we go. Right. Okay, so that's your seven spent. Uh, and Andy, have you spent your seven? Yep. Okay, right. So, oh, Andy's already got his done. Yeah, just made a little fun stack. Yep. So in Aegis, uh, and remind me, Mark, is the other player allowed to know what's in your stack or not? They're allowed to know what units you're deploying, and then uh, they're just not allowed to know the order. But okay. if you're, if you're, doing all one stack is kind of it's usually not that important yeah okay so andy has an aegis a dispatch and then the the anarchist uh, and then it's the three health for the one that's on top yep okay so how do you want to stack yours ian um group, to group or not to group that is the question Well, they seem to do all right on their own last time, so let's leave them as three separate units, I think. Okay. In what order? Um, the two Harriers and the Talon, I think. Okay, so Talon on the bottom. Uh, oh, I accept. You've now got this special ability, haven't you? Oh, so special ability. When deploying from the fortress, which is yeah. exactly what we're doing now, units yeah. with the talent flying may spend their movement to fly to a hex adjacent to any air spire. Right. So this royal talon has two movement, so it can actually start off the game a lot further ahead. Um. Okay. Uh, let's stick him adjacent to this high-rise then, I think. So, uh, I'm just reading this airstrip. When deploying from the fortress, units with the talent flying may spend their movement to fly to a hex adjacent to any air spire. How is that that much better than level one? Uh, because level one is only on the this island. So I can, I, can, I, can go, I can go to here. But if, if, uh, if he had a spire like here... Yeah. He could he could deploy from here. But level oh. one he could not do that because level oh, okay. one is it's, it's just it here. said it spent spent its movement. I thought it could only move two, because that's its movement. No, instead of moving, it moves to a it'll end up adjacent to a spire. Oh right, so it still starts on the fortress gate. Yes. Right, okay, so it happens during movement. I, it was yeah. just that, when it said deployment. That, yeah, my understanding was that it was it was replaced its movement by teleporting to a spire. But. Right. Okay. Okay. So deployment is the term for the first bit of movement from the fortress gate onto the board. Right. Okay. So we're all done. We have our stacks, and we are now ready, I believe, to start the onslaught phase. So off we go then. And who's the first player in the onslaught phase? It is Ian. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Darb's arrived at the fortress gate just as these uh, these group of units have gone. Hello. So, on that top one, what what's armored? I understand that assault is removing um, a tower base. Yeah. So armored. Whenever that unit is attacked, um, it, you reduce the damage dealt by one. Now, specifically, it's when this unit is attacked. Yeah. So it only applies when it is attacked. In other words, a retaliation is not an attack. Sure. Or anything, yeah. So an attack is basically, if you were to attack it, you would deal no damage. But uh, if it was to attack you and didn't kill you, the retaliation, the armoured wouldn't apply to the retaliation. Okay. And I feel like it's important to mention the way that the deployment stacks work with heroes right next to it. 
if Darb attacks the Fortress Gate, the Brownen have the option to have the top unit in their deployment stack uh, take the damage and retaliate for the Fortress instead of having the Fortress take the damage. Okay, cool. And that's not just the Brownen, is it? That's that's a global that's, rule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, with Darb, mm -hmm. he, he can't be attacked by the Correct. dispatch platform. Correct. And he can't be attacked by the Aegis either because he's not got range Correct. attack. Yep. So he'd be quite okay to stay there then, really. Uh, yeah, if he doesn't attack, he can just stay there flying around. Because he's only going to take damage from retaliation then? Yeah. Yeah, because Andy didn't buy the um, the upgrades that would have been able to give him air defence. Which, to be fair, is a, is a reasonable thing because you'd have had to put all of your efforts into that just to build one and then Darby would have just disappeared off yeah okay well let's I don't know tactically what to do with him just withdraw him a little bit or just leave him there to attack the blooming fortress um... question could he move him into a pathway and just sort of block me off uh, so yes and no <laughs> um, because flying means that uh, da, 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 uh, this group can only be attacked yeah 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 uh, another unit may move onto this unit's hex forcing this unit to trade places with it so it kind of acts like your heroes and your minions the flying unit can't really block paths if it didn't have flying though absolutely it, it could stand there and, and block that path completely but then of course it'd be vulnerable to attack so Okay, we'll leave him there for now. If okay. he can't be a, if he can't be attacked, he cannot be attacked by the things currently on the board. Yep. So let's have this Harrier um, charge up to. So this one. Yeah. That seems to be a good place to have him. Okay. And the other one. Yeah. yeah. Just above him. Yeah. Okay. And then this Royal Talon. Are you going to use the airstrip? Level two ability. I think so, and we'll drop him. There. Oh, oh. that one. There. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So that's your movement done. Uh, Andy Spires attack you, but there's nothing in range. Exploration. Do you want to explore? Yes. Let's have a look at this one next to the Royal okay. Talon. Watch it coming oh. up absolutely tight to me there you go oh, i told you look Say at that hello okay so that was an error well now the reward for killing it is you get to construct a spire on that particular hex at no cost right which in your situation is actually not that great because that's no. not a good location for a spire, really. Not really. No. Okay, so we are on attacks. Um, so yeah, if you attack with Darb, if you attack this fortress gate, as Mark said, he can absorb it, and he can respect. choose to take it on the unit, and then the unit would retaliate. And if I attack the platforms, they will retaliate. Uh, no, spires don't retaliate. So I could potentially move Darb adjacent to the dispatch platform. Yep, yeah, I'll let you change that. Move yeah, that. that's fine. Yeah. And then attack the dispatch yeah, platform. So you just simply remove the bottom chip of that. Right. Okay. And then the attack here. 
So the Royal Talon attacks for three. Three, but then the Traxia Roughneck hits you back yeah, for two. Back for two, yeah. yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it. I think your turn is over. So, All right. Andy, limited build action first if you want to. Uh, not this round. Okay, right. Move then. I move one. Uh, I'll try to do it. To, yeah. Not okay. sure what's up in my house at the moment. There you go. Move one. Uh, spires. No. Exploration. Oh. No. Attacks. No. Done. Dean's go. It's going to be a very short round for me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm having the same feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, yeah, wave two is pretty short. We'll see. Um, uh, so who's the who's the leading minion? I think it's this. This fella. This yeah. one is the leading minion, so that has to move first. So one, two, three, four. So let's get him adjacent to that spire. One, four, yeah. And one, two, three, four. I guess. The next one just follows him. And then, right, so what What can I do with the royal? Uh, well, talent? it's a minion, so it has to follow its normal so rules. It has, so it has to move away from the... It has to head towards suit. its mark, yep. Okay, but the track suit has got two movement as well? Uh, no, so the movement on landmarks is only relevant for certain faction special abilities that allow you to like possess them or something like this. So most of the time you ignore the movement value on landmarks, they just stay where they are. Okay. So he'll just move, just move so. up to that to there then. I mean it is flying, so oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, yeah, uh, there. I should just tab. <laughs> yeah, it can move over any terrain type. Yeah, no, that's fine. It, I, I think that's, that's, that's good where it is for now. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's movement done. Uh, Andy Spires can attack, but there's nothing within range that... Oh, no, there is. There is. It can yeah. get my... Yeah, this dispatch platform. So you can hit, hit my Harrier. You can only uh, hit this Harrier. Quick strike. Oh, yeah, quick strike. Sorry, quick strike goes before oh, yeah. the Spires. Happy days. So actually, yeah, you attack the dispatch because that would have been bad otherwise, because otherwise all of these would have taken a damage. So, okay, Ian, you get three source as a reward. Mm -hmm. And that spire is gone. Okay. Um. Right, I think that's it. Andy? Uh, let's um, see. Can I, can I explore? I should oh, have explored the middle sorry. ship. Yeah, you could have done. Before, shouldn't I? Yeah, and have a look at it. Um, no, I'll leave it for now, as soon as I've missed it. Okay. Yeah. Right, Andy? I'll move one. <laughs> Okay. Um, I might as well build another spire here as well. Okay, so you're going to use one of your limited build actions. Yeah. To build, what are you going to build? Uh, the only one that we want another to do. Another dispatch platform. Okay. There you go. There we go. Right, so if you limited build action, four source, built a dispatch platform, you've done your movement. Ian's go. All these units. Yeah, look at all these units. <laughs> Meanwhile, Andy's got this slow hulking mass here. Yeah, I'm just trying to wonder if I can get in there and do him some damage before. It gets <laughs> it gets out of the way. Um, so the Harrier's got to move mm -hmm. and basically engage him, which is not ideal. 
You could move here. But then, uh, one, one of them is going to engage one way or the other, I think. Uh, well, the other one could then go one, two, three, four. So you could really take a, a long route round. He's going to see me off, isn't he, with his two attacks? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Aegis has got two attacks, so... Um, yeah, so if I, if I don't attack him, I do no damage because he'll come and attack me and, okay. I won't and I won't retaliate. Yeah. So it's got to be a suicide mission for the Harry then, I guess. Because Darb's flying, mm -hmm. can he retaliate against Darb? Yes, because uh, it's attack. Yeah, it's attack. Okay. Yeah, because Darb has to fly down to hit him, so he just. No, no, that, that's, that's, that's that's fine. I just, uh, it makes perfect sense. Just asking loopholes. Mm -hmm. um, and the Harrier would actually move here. Uh, because he has to move it. Oh, that's what has I was to wondering. move its full movement if possible. Okay. But where did it start? Here. It, Here. Uh, I it, guess it could have moved. It yeah. could have gone one, two, three, four if you wanted it to. Yeah. It's up to you where you want to end it. Um. Yeah. Well, one of them's got to attack. Yeah. One way or the other. So. Yeah. And then I well, think. Well, no, they, they they don't have to if you don't want. You could have, could avoid it. The other one could go. Yeah. Over there, can it? Yeah. One there, one there. But then he's still going to come in and attack one of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and that's the thing. I need to be the one doing the attacking, so I at least do some damage. <laughs> uh, but you won't with the Harriers. You won't do any damage. Because the armor. So they're yeah. sacrificial anyway. They, they are. Yeah. That's blimmin' annoying. Well, wave one saw the Harriers attack all of Andy's units, so he went back home and built a piece of armour and then went, here, yeah. wear this. <laughs> <laughs> These birds are like pecking at his feet, going, oh, I can't get through. Well, there's nothing I can really do to save them. No. So if I'm not going to do any damage, you can't attack them both. Mm -hmm. Can I move him to there by yeah. zigzagging? I can, can't yeah. I? Just one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's fine. So let's see how that works. Okay, and what's Darb going to do? Uh, I think Darb is going to come and help. Oops. Has the Royal Talent moved? The dead, right? No, it hasn't. No. Oh, so Royal Talent's got to move first. Okay. Yeah. So, you can only move your heroes either before or after all of yeah. your minions, but not yeah, in the middle. No worries. It's not going to make a lot of difference because... If I move him to here, mm -hmm. he's flying, and then move Darb out. Oh, why can't I pick the bloody things up? You need to hold on to them for, for a second or so. Yeah, so you okay. just click with the left mouse button. Uh, I, I obviously wasn't holding him for a long enough. And it picks up the stack. Right. Okay. So... Okay. And Spire's attack, but I don't think there is anything. So, exploration. Exploration. Let's have a look at this thing in uh, the middle. There is a Spire. Oh, yeah, sorry, there is. The dispatch platform here can attack this. Not that it matters, but it no. can. Okay, so, Andy, do you want to roll the dice? Uh, where's the dice? I'll put one in front of you. There you go. Thank you. Was that a roll? Yep. <laughs> you need to be not holding on to it for it to roll. Yeah, so just, just press R over it. There you go. And it's a two. So there you go, dead. And you get two source. I'll put that back in the barracks. Okay, right, so you've explored it, Ian? Yeah. Do you want to reveal it? 
I haven't even seen what it is yet. Come on, fingers. Oh. Mm. Mm, probably not, if the truth be told. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. that's it. That's the end of that. Uh, so no attack. So Andy, you'll go. Uh, right. So I'm going to move one and hit the kitchen. Yep. Uh, you get another two source. Yeah, it's a nice bit. A nice bit of source income for you this turn. Uh, back to you, Ian. I think. Okay. So their movement should be out towards the. Um... The, the caves. They'll Is that correct? Yeah. So I sh he won't come towards me there, will he? Uh, no, I think the Aegis is moving there. Right. Then he can't attack you anyway. No, because he's not got uh, range. Not, yeah. Okay. Let's do this then. Mm -hmm. And that's. That's as much as I can do, I think. That, that is it, yeah. Right, Andy? I'll move one. Try to. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Paul, Paul. Is there anything that I could have done with these three points on my power? Oh, I'd say. Um, you could have put an upgrade on this one. Yeah, if that's okay, just to retro that. Yeah. I, I forgot all about it. Yeah, this will be what, your first limited build action yeah. of this wave. And what type of chip would you like to put on it? Damage, I guess. Okay, I'll put another attack chip on it. There you go. Thank you. Okay, right. Uh, can I have one more, can't it? Yeah, can I have one more. Right, so Andy's moved. And that's it. I think so. Back to you, Ian. Um. So what's his retaliation doing if I hit his castle now? Still his fortress one gate. point. One point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which so. is why the royal talon is absolutely devastating if it's on full health in front yeah. of your fortress gate because it's just well there you go three 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 game over. Yeah. Um, and attack the gate, I guess. Uh, yeah, so that's four damage on the gate, and these two things both take a damage. Yeah. Okay, Andy, you'll go. I'll move one. Okay. Do you want me to move it? Yeah, you better help with that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, all done. Ian? In fact, the gate. Yeah, I think it's game, game over, isn't it? Dead. Yeah. Royal Talon OP. Yeah. <laughs> so did you did you realise that was going to happen, Andy? Um, I didn't realise it was going to happen that quickly, but I knew I was going to die this round. I wanted to right. try and do something interesting and attack on the way. Yeah. But um. So. Yeah, they got you too quick. What you probably could have done is instead of grouping all of it together, you could have grouped the dispatch. So that the dispatch uh, is stuck behind the Aegis and attacking yeah. uh, his flying units with range instead of being stuck, stuck underneath not existing. Yeah. But then if the dispatch is still marching forwards, I could have hidden behind this group of trees and then got in behind anyway. That was my plan. Right. And that, the annoying thing, it was picking up that... Um, that thing down at the bottom there, the uh, the tracks here. Oh, tracks here, roughneck. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just going to pile that um, pile of talon. Yeah. To to be able to start him halfway up the board. Yeah. Is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, and I that, the plan was just to get him in into that gate within yeah. two three turns. As soon as possible. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, say so from my experience of playing the Brawnen is that the. Um, uh, the smelter upgrade, which does cost six source, 
but then once it's once it's been done you can then put the lance launcher on the board and that and that would have been an answer stick the lance launcher there uh, as, as long as you didn't kill it and that would have given you then some protection from from flying units i was going to just do all three stronghold upgrades to get three retaliate damage oh right okay so that that was my alternative for dealing with it Which but, that um, one? oh yeah the gate spikes yeah yeah, wow, that would have done it, wouldn't it? That, that would have that would have hurt. <laughs> that, would, that would have definitely hurt. Um, Plus and the just, dice. Yeah, just as a note, the stronghold level one upgrade, the Forsaken Artillery, that was the only real defence that the Brawnen had against the Royal Talon on turn uh, on wave one, because you basically you buy this dice and then it's one use only and it hits something with a big amount of damage at range, uh, and yeah, that that's a, a that's that's what they can use to get rid of the Royal Talon. Um, but there you go. So impressions from your first game. Was it what you thought it might be? And Ian, you'd, you'd seen the videos before, so you kind of knew roughly what it was I, like. I got, I got an idea it was my sort of game. Yeah. Um, I, I like the whole idea of upgrading the castle and some of these things. I'll, I'll be interested to have a look at the other ones. I'll perhaps download those later and, and have a look. Yeah. Um, but some of them look really powerful. Um, so it'd be yeah. interesting to see how different units interact with each other yep. um, and spotting that airstrip and the fact that I've got those two towers pretty much in the right line um, yep. when I was putting the mats down I was looking to do, sort of do a corridor of fire right um, and then hopefully be able to, to put things down mm -hmm. and, and I very nearly bought out that gate for a relic right uh, that, that first one uh, to be able to put a tower there, yeah. So, so it's been quite a gauntlet to run on the approach to my gate. Yeah, I'd have been interested to see if Andy's um, tank uh, would have uh, got through. To be honest, because he's got some good attack. Well, where would it have gone? I could have gone up the top here, couldn't it? So it avoided most of that for a few turns. Well, well, this one's yeah. You'd have to go over the top. This one has range three. No, range two and attack. Three, attack two. Yeah. yeah. So still only range two. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have got caught here, on your way through. Yeah, probably would have done quite a bit of damage to it there. Yeah. And this one's got range uh, damage two as well. Yeah. I mean, That's Andy had this Earthscape, but the problem is because Andy didn't have any influence, uh, you wouldn't have been able to place it. You know, if, if you managed to get on the centre, you could have then placed this here. Yeah, you could have gone and killed that massive bear. Look at this beast. I know. <laughs> yeah. And the bonus but, is, you get to build a spire right in the middle, and then it, suddenly you put the earthscape here, and then the ages can go wandering around here, ignoring all of the towers, and all yeah. of a sudden... We could have taken that bear, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you uh, could. So Andy did have influence when he had his, his spire up here, and what he could have also done was, if he wanted to, he could place the earthscape like this. And it would have also forced them to go along that right. way. Right. Okay. And, and he'd be shooting them uh, right at the start of, at the entrance of his gate. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't my earth. Um, no, yeah, it was Andy's. It was Andy's earth piece, so he was using yeah. it to avoid. Yeah, it would have been nice to go somewhere around. You know. Oops. Oh, I just killed it. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, so, yeah, there's some interesting decisions. I, I, yeah. And it's, it's one of those games where, as I say, the first couple of times I played it, I got an Earthscape and I'm like, I've no idea. I, I, I literally have no idea where to place this because I couldn't work out how this was going to have an impact on the game. And then the more I played it, the more I got used to it. And then, as I say, when I played against Mark and he was like, oh, yeah, if you put this there, then that means that's going to go around there, which means this. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, OK. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> you're, affecting, you're affecting a path. Yeah. Oh, oh Lord, there's so much. <laughs> uh, in, in these and the fact that you can drop a tower on it if you've got the points yeah yeah you yeah. stick it on drop a tower on it and uh yeah come and, come and get so me. yeah they, they can be quite powerful you've just got to know got to know when to use them it's also so. really important to use them for when you don't have any uh source wells available mm -hmm. like Brandon didn't have source wells that they could place spires on so they kept putting them in there but they could have just placed an earthscape like here or something and then put their their air defense spire over here, so now the Royal Town's getting shot at with air defense before it yeah. gets to your fortress. Yeah. 
I definitely think Braunen versus Ayres, you, you've got to buy the smelter upgrade and get the Lance, the Lance launcher. Because otherwise there's so many flying units that are just going to be coming at you. So, so what did yeah, you think, Andy, for your first game? Was it what you thought it might be? Yeah, approximately, yeah, I think so. It's um, yeah, an interesting dynamic with the, the towers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's not a game that you can play a couple of times. It's it was, uh, the, <laughs> the factions are more asymmetric than I was expecting. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they definitely are, and especially once, once you start really playing them and really getting to know how they work. Mark, has anybody done... I know, I know Chip Theory games have done like some guides on their website, but I'm talking about, you know, when you played against me, and I know I keep referring to that game, but that level of detail and strategy, has anybody done that sort of guide in either video or written format? Well, I have guides on uh, Board Game Geek. I have okay. the, the Every Thought I've Ever Had About Cloud Spire guide, which right. is like uh, 30 pages on Word. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, yes. And then, and then, then each faction has their own little guide. That right. I, okay. I send, send me the link so I don't have to look for it later, because um, that's something that I will I will go to bed with, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and have a read through. And and because it is a game, as I say, I love the game. I'm not very good at the game, but and I, and I've spoken about this a lot in the last couple of months on like my live Q and A's, in the fact that I don't play games regularly enough to become good enough at them that I feel comfortable with them. And this is one game that I do want to do that because I enjoy it. And I think I think I will enjoy it more once I feel more comfortable with, you know, knowing what I'm doing and making those decisions. No, go on. No, I was just going to say, absolutely. You've got so many combinations. I, I, there's me looking at how I'm going to spend my CPs on my, my units. Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough CPs. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, not at the start, but then in wave four you get eleven. But even eleven's not that much. But <laughs> well, well, in in terms of you're still only looking at mate, if you if you get your your big hero, yeah, you're still not looking at a great deal of support units. No, no. So it's uh, but then I think perhaps if you've got a bunch of these things, is there only one the two humming hummingers? Yeah. So I don't know. It's uh, it's an interesting mechanic that your minions are just going to keep charging forward, so they yes. will eventually batter themselves to death on the gates. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that they're, they're not rolling over. Um, I guess if I could have afforded uh, the Nestor hero and the Humminger, see, but see, that's fourteen points all of a sudden for two yeah. hummingers. So trying to get the elfin thing going and how because that bomb was quite devastating yeah yeah because it uh, deals damage to spires as well yeah so um and my original plan which was thwarted because i didn't have the, the space to put the bomb in if yeah. i would not left left it was to take attack the, the top uh, geezer he got one point and then dropped the bomb Mm -hmm. and then I got another attack but I didn't realise that the bomb occurred on a move right. until you said so yeah. um, in fact yeah. it's before or after movement yeah well, well, well so, yeah. so it's normally before, do it after it's, it's before the it's the first attack effectively it, yeah. isn't it yeah so um, yeah that was a bit of a, 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 a disappointment shall we say yeah. it worked out I mean and one of the rules go on it's it's really important that it happens before movement because that actually makes them immune to air defense fires, basically, mm -hmm. which is really dumb. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. One of the um, one of the things we didn't see was the rule that I keep getting wrong, which is the campfire mode rule. Uh, but basically, as soon as one side has lost all of its units, the heroes on the other side go into campfire mode, and they then they effectively become inactive for the rest of that wave so the wave still ends when all of the minions have gone but if one side loses everything the opponent's heroes go into campfire mode and i'm assuming it's in there for game balance because if one player loses you know all of their stuff and the other player still has minions and heroes left their heroes will just come over and smash you so yeah that rule is in there for that but it didn't happen in our game right then so uh yeah so thank you very much uh andy and ian for joining me 
Thank you very much for, for hosting it. That's all right. Yeah, thanks for inviting. Thank uh, you thanks, very thanks, much, thanks Mark, for, the for, game, for, Andy. It was, for being uh, there. Interesting. And Mark, yeah, thank you. I think every copy of Cloudspire that's sold has actually got Mark's phone number on, oh, sorry, cell number <laughs> on, on the back of the rule book. So, yeah, good move. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm really annoyed because Chip Theory Games, they took the, they took my picture and they put it on the anarchist, so. That's your picture, is it? <laughs> is this mod available? This is, mo this mod is available. Um, it is an unofficial mod, so it was right. not done by Chip Theory Games. But I asked Chip Theory Games if they would be happy if I, you know, did a live stream of this because Chip Theory Games are sponsoring this stream. Um, I did that was on the splash screen at the start, uh, and I said, "Look, are you happy if I use the tabletop simulator mod?" Um, because I just felt uh, for you to learn in the game, for me to have it physically set up here and having to keep, I'd have need like helmet cam or something like that. Yeah, the amount of stuff I was looking at while Andy was taking his turn. Yeah. Um, I, I would have struggled yeah. I think, in another two yeah. hours to. Yeah. Now, I have played Cloud Spire remotely over Skype with Ricky Royal and with Mark Dainty from Notboard Gaming, but they had the game physically set up at their end as well. Yeah. And, I, and, and they were mirroring exactly what was happening. Um, so, yeah, you can, if, if you know somebody who's got Cloud Spire at home and you want to play against them during lockdown, you can. I've absolutely done it. Just had one camera, share the screen over Skype, and as long as you explain to each other what's happening, yeah, it should be fine. Or play on tabletop simulator like this, but you will have the issues of the, the health chips that, that, that we kept having. True. So, Thanks for winning my game against Paul. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My rematch. Right. So yeah, thank you to everybody for joining me. Um, I'm going to disappear now and I'll be back later on tonight. So I've got two more streams, three more streams tonight. Uh, I've got Codenames, which was in a, going to be in about an hour and three quarters time doing a live game of Codenames uh, online. Then just after that, we're playing Just One. Uh, we're going to be doing a live stream of us playing Just One. Uh, and then at nine o'clock tonight, I'm doing the closing ceremony. So this weekend has been virtual GridCon, uh, where I've been live streaming, playing games. But also there's been quite a few dozen people, a few dozens of people, I think, um, on my virtual disc on my Discord server, playing lots of games uh, with each other. Uh, we're also doing a charity raffle. You have uh, 45 minutes left if you want to enter the charity raffle. Um, there's a lot of prizes available. We're raising a ton of money for charity. Justgiving.com slash virtual gridcon if you're interested in donating and you could win some prizes. Um, but yeah, that's everything. So yeah, thank you very much to everybody for watching and thank you to everybody who watches this afterwards. If you've got any comments, obviously, um, yeah, put them in the show notes and let me know. Other than that, I will say goodbye. I'll see you all next time. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Cheers. Gaming Rules is proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.